Now, have you walked into a court? What happens? They choose who you are. So aren't they supposed to be your public servants? Aren't you supposed to be the boss and then the employee? Well, and how come you stood up when the judge walked into the room? Because the minute you stood up, you said, I'm the employee. Employees stand when the boss walks in the room. You know what the boss does when an employee walks up to the room? He leans back in his chair, he puts his feet up on the desk, and he grabs a cigar. Okay. <laughs> That's what the boss does. So the judge, he walked through the door from his chambers in the courtroom. The bailiff says, I'll rise for the Honorable Judge Bob Smith. And everybody stands up. If there's one person sitting down, the judge walks over. And just before he sits in his chair, he scans the room. Do you know the bailiff also scans the room? Because after the court's done, he has to swear an affidavit that no one was sitting when the judge walked in. Oh. Okay, he's the witness. Because the guy challenging his jurisdiction is the one that's still sitting. You stand up, you're automatically a citizen. He's got they've got tacit agreement that you're a citizen. They have to get tacit agreement of four things, and they're gonna presume it. Okay, first of all, it's all through presumption. Presumption, assumption, hearsay, and previously are the four most important words in the law, and they're not going to teach you that in law school, I guarantee it. And I love what they teach us in law school. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Policy and procedure and how to remain in honor, not dishonor. And they teach us a lot of language and how to be a good secretary and how to do forms in proper, proper manner. What font type size to use and <laughs> Stacy. How to space things and you know, they teach us all that good stuff in law school. But they don't teach us the law. And that's an interesting fact. They just don't teach us the law. They don't teach us the award of the law. They don't teach us where it comes from. And they don't teach proper jurisdiction. So anyway, I got a little off track because I get heated on these kind of topics, but forgive me for that. But uh, when you're what they're getting your tacit agreement of is you being a citizen, a person, and a resident. A citizen is a, used to stand for city employee. I'll tell you how it came about. At the end of the Revolutionary War, King of England left some British soldiers upon this land as citizens to provide the American free men of the world, of America, free men of America, with essential governmental services. So if he left citizens to provide the free people with governmental services, he's trying to take over government right from the get-go, isn't he? But he's also saying an employee of government is a citizen. So don't they offer you a benefits package? Don't they call it privileges and benefits? Ah. Same thing your HR representative of your company says, right? <laughs> yeah. See, a citizen stood for city employee at that time. And the 14th Amendment of the Constitution made you all citizens when you were really free men and women, when you were really state nationals, Arizonans. So if you want to take government back, you got to take it back first inside you. Be the men and women, be the sons and daughters of God, be the Arizonan or the Oregonian or the California. Stand up and understand what government is, what it means, where our laws come from, what three jurisdictions we're in. It's not that complicated. I'm boiling it down to the simplest form I possibly can so everybody can understand it because we need to teach the masses. You know, since, since April 11, 1953, our federal government took over our school systems. They paraded Jane Spalding around as this sweet little old lady school teacher. And what a precious thing she was. If you could think of the best school teacher in the whole world, you'd picture Jane Spalding in your mind. And she sold the states on standardized education, on the auspices of government funding, 
And she, they paraded her around every state for two years. And they finally on April 11th, got the last state to sign in on the deal. And she became the head of the Department of Education. And 49 days later, she was fired and they put in Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. Oh, no. Who made $140 million that year and didn't pay one dime in taxes. And at his acceptance speech, he said, I consider this the greatest position in government. And the flash bulbs went off and the news reporters all raised their hands. And they said, why do you consider it more important than the president and the vice president of the United States? And he says, absolutely I do, because if you give me one generation, one decade, I'll change the minds and therefore the direction of the world. And he did. Everything got standardized education or I, I can, Having, having had a degree in history and studied history my whole life, I can go through a his, any history textbook and show you that everything in there is a lie. Everything in our children's textbooks are lies. Look at Common Core Math. That's a perfect example of how far-fetched they can make things. Okay? So we have been indoctrinated by our public school system. I think the first thing we all ought to do is pull your kids out of school and an approved course is Ron Paul's homeschooling program. Yeah. It's a nationwide approved course. I mean, guy run for president, I wish he would have got it. But homeschool your kids, start teaching them the truth, seek the truth because nothing I learned in kindergarten through 12th grade was the truth. I can tell you that I've disproved it all and I'm a little pissed about it. Wasted 12 years of my life. Okay. <clears throat> so, how does that get your kids back? Citizen, person, resident. What is the legal definition of the word resident? It is someone there temporarily to do business. That's the legal definition of the word resident. Someone there temporarily to do business. By the sheer use of how you write your address down on a piece of paper, makes you a, live in Washington, DC, and you're residing in Arizona temporarily to do business. The United States of America was divided into 12 United States postal districts. All courts were U.S. District Postal Courts. We'll get into that portion of it in a minute. So if you don't say your name in upper and lower case, in care of rural route, and then your house and street address, and then your city, and then spell out your state, don't use AZ, because that's a corporation. Arizona in all capital letters, the state of Arizona is a corporation. Arizona is a territory. It's a geographical location on a map. Okay. State of Arizona is a corporation. Remember, there's two of everything in the United States. You got to understand this really quick. Maricopa County Corporation, Maricopa, a geographical location on a map. City of Phoenix is a corporation. Phoenix is a, is a geographical location on a map. And they're two entirely separate things in jurisdiction. Okay. Child Protective Services is a for private, for profit business. It has nothing to do with the Jure government. Neither does your police force. Neither does the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Okay. They're not de jure government. The Supreme Court of the United States says, since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. Do they? Can an employee from Walmart kick your door down, steal your kid? Man, I'd shoot them right there if they tried that, right? Protect your family. But these cops are doing it. The CPSI agents are doing it. They have no legal right to do that whatsoever. They're not following any due process of law. 
The Supreme Court goes on to say the rules, codes, statutes, ordinances, policies, executive orders are not law. They are not law. Now they're making us believe they're law, right? They tell us, oh, it's the law. Every time they say that, I just want to strangle them, you know? It's the law, you have to put on your turn signal when you make that corner. No, you have to be safe. Nobody can tell me to turn, put my, I have to put my turn signal on, but if I want to be safe, I'm going to do it anyway, you know? But if I look behind me and there's no cars for a mile and I look both ways and there's no cars for a mile and I look in front of me and there's no cars for a mile, how the hell am I breaking the law not putting my turn signal on? Okay, you see what I'm saying? Teaching a little fire and brimstone in here. I use the word hell, so. <laughs> anyway, we have to understand rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're corporate bylaws, according to the Supreme Court. Corporate bylaws. So does the employee of McDonald's or Walmart have to follow McDonald's or Walmart's corporate bylaws? Yes, they do. But if we walk in their store to buy something, do we have to follow the rules that employee has to follow? No, we don't. Why are they making us believe that we do? You see what I'm saying? Why are they making us believe that we do? Any way they can control us, make us passive, the easier we are to rob. Okay, and some of you have heard this a million times, but if you want to pull a con job off on a, on a million people and you have to hire 50 people to work for you who will help you pull off that con job, do you know if you told them the whole plan, they'd probably all quit? Because people are basically good, honest, moral people. They're our neighbors, right? They live next door, down the street. And they're basically good, honest, moral. They want to go to work every day and they want to go home. And they want to be with their kids and, and go to sleep and be able to sleep the night and be able to converse with their spouse and all is well and get a paycheck at the end of the day. All right. So you take those 50 people and you compartmentalize them. You tell them, hey, police officer, this is your job, your duty. That's it. Hey, attorney. This is your job, your duty, that's it. Hey, child protective services worker, this is your job, your duty, that's it. Judge, same way, doesn't matter. I mean, make whatever, whoever you're dealing with as one of those 50 people. Now all of a sudden, they're just doing their job, they can be good, moral, honest people, and they're stealing from a million people through joining together and joined her conspiracy. Cons under Title 18, Section 241, it's a conspiracy to deprive you of your rights. That's what it is. Under Title 18, Section 242, it's a deprivation of rights under the color of law. What is the color of law? That means something that you think is law that isn't. It's a fallacy. Rules, codes, statutes, and policies, ordinances, executive orders, whatever they want to call it, whatever they want to name it, is a fallacy. It's a corporate bylaw. Are you getting a paycheck from the federal government? I mean, some people get welfare and housing and things like that. They're getting a paycheck, trust me. But most of us aren't. So the quicker you can wean yourself off the tit of government, the better off we're all gonna be, okay? But on the other hand, most of us aren't. Most of us are just men and women getting up on Sunday morning and going to church and we go to the grocery store and the doctor's office. We'll talk about doctors in a minute because that all changed. And going, going to get a movie and a pizza and then coming home, watch TV with our family or something, okay? We don't need a driver's license to do any of those things. We don't need to be stopped and harassed by the police to do those things. In fact, they actually commit a lot of felonies in their process of doing that. Do you know that when a police officer puts his lights on behind you to stop you, he is creating an emergency where none existed and that's a felony? The minute he flips those lights on, he created an emergency where none existed. That's a felony. 
He walks up to your window, you roll your window down, and he gives your tacit agreement of being a citizen, a person, or resident within 60 seconds. Here's how he does it. I was a deputy sheriff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, can I have your driver's license, proof of insurance, and registration, please? And you dig them all out and you hand them to me. The minute you did exactly what he told you to do, what the boss told you to do, you're an employee, and he got your tacit agreement of being a citizen. Now he just looks at your driver's license, got your name in all caps. Well, that's your persona. He's got a tacit agreement of you being a person. He looks at your address. Now you live in Washington, D.C., but you reside here in Arizona temporarily to do business because your zip code says eight something, something, something. That's the eighth district of the District of Columbia. You know, you look at the USPS laws, it says you can be zip exempt if you want to. You know, using a zip code is voluntary. It doesn't even slow your mail down. Okay, so you voluntarily use your zip code. You live in Washington, D.C. There's 320 million people in the United States that live in Washington, D.C., and they reside in whatever state they're in just temporarily to do business. Now you're fully in admiralty law. That's how you're going to be treated. That's how you're going to be dredged. You're boxed into that corner, and you can't use the benefits of trust law or contract law very well. I mean, equity law. You're in contract law. So now there better be a contract, right? So what do they get you to do? How many papers did they make you sign, right? Sign to steal your own kid. Isn't that sad? That's the most sad thing on earth. I'm almost in tears right now. Because that's not the, how they present it. They deceive her without full and honest disclosure of what that means, okay? How do you avoid a contract? Well, what are the elements of a contract? Do you guys know? There's like eight elements to a contract. <coughs> this is just your learning. Okay, there, there must be privity of contract. That's one. What is it? I'm sorry. Privity. That's one they all want you to forget. They all want you to forget that there must be privity of contract. You know what that means? Let's just say I have a contract with my credit card company. And I forget to pay the bill and they send me to a collection agency. Did I have a contract with the collection agency? No. Chances are the collection agency for a reduced amount, 50 cents on the dollar or 30 cents on the dollar, bought that debt from a credit card company. What you really need to do is say, thank you very much for that gift. I really needed it at this point in my life. I couldn't really afford to make that payment. Thank you so much for paying my debt off for me. But there's no privity of contract. I don't have a contract with that collection agency. Okay, that's what privity of contract, that's the one they all want to forget. Okay, so there's just a little bit there. There's gotta be signatures, there's gotta be a meeting of the minds, there's gotta be consideration, there's gotta be full and honest disclosure of the facts. Then you have a contract. You gotta have eight elements to your contract. Okay. They'd like you to believe that it's just consideration and an agreement. <laughs> oh, that's not that's not it. Why do most government forms have boxes? They put everything in boxes. Do you notice that? Mm -hmm. It's so you can't sue the government. Oh. They they boxed everything and made it not part of the contract. The contract. It's the four corners rule. Anything you put a box around, if you got a contract and you put a box around your zip code, they can't hold you as being in Washington, D.C. because that zip code is not part of the contract. It's inside of a box. <laughs> ah, God, all government forms are just a bunch of boxes. <laughs> they don't want you suing the government. That's what, And then when you do sue them, you lose because you didn't know why. Yeah. Now I'm just telling you why. Okay. I mean, there's many, many things we need to learn as men and women how to operate and be free people. 
you can be free if you want. Once you know all three jurisdictions, you can you can step back and forth from one to the other. You know, all these patriot groups and stuff, sovereign citizens, they just they just want to be in common law. And, they, and that's only the only reason they do that, guys. Don't find them at fault. The only reason they do that is they see the corruption in the admiralty system. So they're sick and tired of it. Okay. But they're good, honest, moral people. They're, they're no different than you and me. It doesn't matter if we're black, white, Asian. We're all in this thing together. Start treating everybody like we're one people. Okay? Doesn't matter. There's three jurisdictions of law. Know when to be in the one you need to be in at the time you need to be in it. When you're dealing with the states and finance and money and stuff, put everything in trust. Let the trust own it all. Be the trustee. Leave it to your children as the beneficiaries. Put it in trust. Then it's not going to get stolen from you. Okay? It's not going to get a turn by the attorney. See? Who can an attorney represent? This is very, very important. I know it seems like I say it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, dead entities, an entity or a corporation, a minor, somebody infirmed, and somebody incompetent. That's what it says in the law, who an attorney can represent. Did you hear man or woman? No. No, they can't represent a man or a woman. They cannot represent a man or a woman. That's why these judges try and force you to have an attorney. Because it forces you into admiralty jurisdiction. Okay. You know why they say you, you can't bring the Constitution up in court? Let me tell you about Ryan Bundy. I was Ryan Bundy's legal team. And Ryan's getting tried with a whole bunch of other people, and all these other people have lawyers, right? And Ryan didn't have one because I told him not to have one. Okay. I said, that's the worst thing you could ever do. And Ryan believed what I said. I'd known Ryan for a while. So, goes into court every day, and at first he had his constitution in his pocket. And the judge told him, you can't bring that constitution up. And then some of the other guys were mentioning the constitution. They say, oh, no, you can't bring a constitution up. They'd carry their Bibles in them with them. Oh, no, you can't have that Bible in the courtroom. Okay, other than the one they make you swear your hand on to, which they don't even do anymore. Okay. You can't have that in here. You can't have the Constitution in here. You can't talk about it. You can't bring it up. Why is the judge telling you that? Because you're a citizen. You're not a party to it. You all think you have rights. You're a party to the Constitution. No, you're not. Only a state national has is a party to the Constitution. We, the people, the state nationals, are ones who created government. U.S. citizens were created by government. Ah, you can't be a party to something that you were created by. You understand that? Mm -hmm. So what happened with Ryan? They said, oh, okay, you know, he, they tried to force him to have an attorney several times. Okay. <clears throat> And he just kept saying, no, I don't want an attorney. So they said, okay, we file a document saying we, we don't want an attorney. Says, oh, we're pro se. You're pro se. Well, what does pro se mean? Professional self. Anytime you're a professional, you're simply an attorney representing your persona, your entity, right? So we file a document that says, no, I'm not pro se, I'm sui juris. And what do they say? Okay, if you don't want to be pro se, well, we'll say you're pro per. Well, it's pro per, professional persona, right? Still a professional, still representing your person, your entity. Nothing changed, really, right? In the law, I'm giving you the short version. The, you know, he can tell you that. I'm giving you the short version, all right? But it's the, it's, it's the same. So now, we say, no, you're not pro per, you're sujuris. 
Then we told them again, you're not pro per, you're su juris. The rule of three, you got to tell them three times. They have to ask you things three times. They'll try three times to force you to have an attorney. If you keep saying no, and they can get mean, okay? They can get darn mean about it. They can say, I really think you should have a public defender. You stand up and say, no, oh, I'm so jurist. I want to represent myself. And they'll say, you know, young lady, if you don't take our public defender, you're probably not going to win this case. Mm -hmm. That's what my attorney said about him. <laughs> there you go. And you say no. And they'll say, if you don't take a, like in Jamie Kobat's case, she had been tried in four felony counts of fraud in the Ninth District Federal Courthouse and lost before I met her. And they said, if you don't take our public defender, we're going to call in the U.S. Marshals right now and have you thrown in jail. Hmm? See, the, he's saying it three times, following the rule of three, but he's just saying it three different ways, getting more forceful and more forceful each time, trying to through fear and coercion, mm -hmm. pull you back into their jurisdiction. That's what he's trying to do. You got to remember, it's a tug of war. Mm -hmm. He's trying to pull you into admiralty, and you're saying, no, right now I'm not in admiralty. If I want to be in admiralty, let's sign a contract with the elements of the contract, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, you, you can control that. Mm -hmm. It's your self-determination. Mm. So Ryan, after we filed the third document, I said, Ryan, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take your copy of the Constitution and put it in your pocket. And if you got to stick something in it below that so it sticks way up out of your pocket, <laughs> I want you to wear it in the courtroom. <laughs> See, before that, the U.S. Marshals were stopping at the door and confiscating com uh, constitutions, even from the general public, the audience. Mm. Wow. They wouldn't allow it into the courtroom. Wow. Mm. So, Ryan, kept it way up there in his pocket like that. And he walks in, he sits down. The U.S. Marshal smiled at him. And they put a federal witness on the stand, a BLM agent, and the BLM agent sitting on the stand. And all these other guys and their attorneys are all questioning this BLM agent. Ryan's basically been sitting there not allowed to speak for months, right? Months of periods, not allowed to speak. And all of a sudden, all the attorneys get done questioning this guy. And the judge looks over at Ryan and says, Ryan, would you like to question the witness? I was shocked Ryan to death. And he stands up and he says, yes, I would. And he walks over and he says, did you swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution? And the guy says, yes, I did. And Ryan gets a little cocky and he says, well, have you read it? <laughs> And he admitted he did. So Ryan pulls it out of his pocket and he proceeds for three and a half hours <laughs> to go through the Constitution and create a dialogue and ask him questions about it. He even corrected the guy two or three times in there on what certain things meant. Oh. And then he went and sat down. <laughs> and then the next hearing, they all showed up in court. She threw the gavel down, dismissed the case, and we won the wow. It's done, it was over with. And everybody thinks it was the Wooten memo. But see, the Wooten memo had been already been denied by motion not to be brought up in court. But Ryan was allowed to mention it in the courtroom that day. See, all he did is mention it. He just says, next time we'll talk about the Wooten memo. And the next, very next hearing, they all showed up. She dismissed the case and sent everybody home except those that took a plea deal. They all went to jail. Yeah. Everyone that allowed their attorney to talk them into taking a plea deal went to jail. Okay, very important lesson right there. So very interesting how our court systems work. It is all based off presumption of you being a citizen, a person, a resident, and a minor. What is the legal definition of the word minor? Under the age of Simple. 18. Somebody under the age of 18 years old, or somebody of any age who is incompetent. No, who has not claimed their minor account. 
Claimed their minor account. You're assessed a QV. That's your minor account. See, when you were born, when a child is born, it comes out of the water through the birth canal and is birthed at the dock by the doctor and is named as a vessel. The names of ships are all capital letters, named as a vessel. Hmm. It arrives at the dock, it's docked, it's there for port taxes to be taken. Okay. You think I'm kidding? No. It puts you in admiralty jurisdiction. Yeah. That's how they treat you. That's where the term doctor came from 970 years ago. Huh. Doctor. Okay. There's a difference between a doctor and a physician. But aren't today, aren't they all labeled doctors? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Different jurisdictions. So you have to learn language. I can travel upon the roadways in private in my automobile. With my passport as my protection, I am lawful. Or I can drive down the highway in my motor vehicle, follow all the rules, codes, and statutes, and I am legal with my driver's license. See the same thing, just going down the road in the car, right? Car is short for carriage. Going down the road in the car. How about if you but I told you I different two. It's all English, but it's two different languages. They call it legalese. Oh, well. Right. There's actually three different languages in the English language in legalese for three different jurisdictions. Trust trustee beneficiary is in ecclesiastical or canon law. See. Contracts, which are what? Signatories. See, men and women, we write our autobiographies and we sign our autograph. If they're saying sign here, signature line, they're creating a contract, you're in admiralty law. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the language? Mm -hmm. See, the problem is they didn't teach us English in school. No. They didn't teach us law, legalese, the three different languages. It, it could be all in French. It could be all in Japanese. It could be all in, in English or Spanish. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But there's inside each of those languages, there are three different languages of legalese. It's the word you use determines the jurisdiction under which you stand. Juris, right law, diction, words. Okay. What do they say? Oh, it's in the city's jurisdiction, or it's in the county's jurisdiction, or it's in the state's jurisdiction, or it's in the federal go government's jurisdiction, or it's in this agency's jurisdiction. No, it's in their venue. See, all they did is took out the word venue and inserted the word jurisdiction to confuse the public. Now you're going, oh my God, what jurisdiction is it in? <laughs> It's all admiralty, for Christ's sakes. It's all in one jurisdiction. <laughs> well, see how they confused you? You agree with that? Unless okay. you want them to do something for you, and they'll say, that's not my jurisdiction. Inland piracy and slave trading, that's yeah. what it says. That's what it is. See, the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, the original 13th Amendment, let's talk about it first. The original 13th Amendment in the original Constitution and prior to that in the Articles of Confederation, the first Constitution usurped the Articles of Confederation. See, most people don't know anything about the Civil War and about our history. But the name of this country originally was the Confederated States. Confederated United States of America. The Confederated States United States of America. Then we became the United States of America in 1776. George Washington became our first president, but we had 13 presidents before that. Did anybody know their names? Did anybody know who one of them was black? 
governors of the uh, colonies, right? No. no? Confederated. It's the Confederated States. Oh. We're talking about the original United States prior to 1776. Then we became the United States of America. And then with Abe Lincoln, we changed again. See, Abe Lincoln put some things into place so that in 1871, which was after he died, it changed again. Okay. But let's talk about what those are. The original 13th Amendment was called the Tona Amendment. What? Tona, T-O-N-A, Titles of Nobility Act. T-O-N-A, Titles of Nobility Act. No bar association member could hold office in public office. Was a lawyer a bar member? Yeah. Yes, he was. So he wasn't allowed to become the president of the United States. Not only that, prior to taking presidency, and I probably shouldn't be talking bad about it because we all have opinions about our president. But prior to becoming president of the United States, he was the governor of Illinois. He was also a neighbor and a follower of Karl Marx. And while he was governor of Illinois, and Illinois still screwed up because of it, he passed some laws that were known as communistic laws. So if you go spend two years in the National Archives of Washington, D.C., like I did, and you read letters and journals of people who were written during the time, you'll see that nobody wanted the communists as president of the United States, looking for lightning bolts, <laughs> as president of the United States. So when he, it wasn't until the big bankers of Boston, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia got behind him and put $7 million into his campaign. You know how much $7 million was in 1859? Big bucks. That was a lot of money. You know his opponent had $5,000 budget? That's why he was made president. They bought and paid for it. Okay. See, as children, we get up on stage when we're little, and we do this little play called Four Storm Seven Years Ago. We're taught how honest old and honest Dave was and how he never told a lie, right? And the teachers tell us, be persistent, kids, because even President Lincoln ran for president several times and failed. But if you just keep trying, one day you too could be president of the United States. So we're taught persistence by the use of Abe Lincoln, not knowing that he was actually, his presidency was bought for. And because he was a bar member, they hid the original 13th Amendment, the Tona Amendment. Ah, you see? They could basically hide anything they want in those days, man. They printed a newspaper in New York, the guys in San Francisco were reading it for three months. Okay, we didn't have a instant access like the internet. You know, it took a long time for news to get around. By then, everything's already been done and accomplished, you know, before the people found out about yeah. it. <laughs> so, so anyway, he wasn't allowed to be president. So what happened? He goes in and he bankrupts the Virginia Trading Company and the original United States of America Trading Company. I say trading company. You remember Route 66? Mm -hmm. Remember all the old businesses on Route 66? How it said trading company, trading company. They were all unincorporated. Okay. And an unincorporated government is a de jure government of we the people. Everybody takes part, everybody votes, and it's a bottom up form of government. Now we have a top down form of government called a corporation. All corporations are flipped on in. It's top down, right? A du jour government starts in our townships and parishes and we all get together and we talk about what we need and then we make law, pass law and it works its way up to the top. Okay, that is not how our government is now, right? So Abraham Lincoln couldn't be president of the original United States, so what did he do? He signed executive order number one, which put the Grand Army of the Republic in charge of the United States government. And he bankrupted the original United States government. And he made himself commander in chief of the arm of the US Army. So that's how our president became commander in chief. See, prior to Abe Lincoln, we had never had an executive order. 
what is an executive order? Isn't an executive ahead of a corporation? Mm -hmm. You see, he made the United States of America a Delaware corporation. Prior to that, it was unincorporated. All right. So he made it a corporation. He bankrupted the original United States, and all he did is capitalize the the, capitalize, and he's got a corporation. And then we fought a civil war. What was the civil war over? Don't say slavery, because it wasn't happening. It was the division between North and South. It was the, yes, it was, but it was the Morrill Act. Senator Morrill, <laughs> Abe Lincoln got Senator Morrill to pass a, a law that was an unfair tax advantage. The manufacturing companies and banking and railroads of the North were taxed at three to 6%. And the farmers of the South were taxed as high as 60% wow. on cotton and tobacco and other things. And so when the Morrill Act passed, 11 delegates from seven Southern states walked out of Congress, <laughs> leaving Congress without a quorum, leaving it sin die. It died that day the government of the United States Corporation that Abe Lincoln had formed died that day. So what'd they do? Well, the army was in charge of it. If you look at executive order number 100, which Lincoln signed within 30 days of his presidency, he signed 100 executive orders. None had ever been signed before in history. And then Lincoln signed up 100 executive orders in 30 days. Executive order number 100 was called the Labor Code. The Labor Code. It put the entire United States under martial <laughs> rule, not martial law, under martial rule. Who is ahead of our court system right now? Don't hold up your hand and say the Attorney General. No, he's in charge of all the lawyers that run the court system. The head of the court system is a Provost Marshal General of the United States Army. What? The Provost Marshal General of the United States Army is in charge of our court systems. But with the Posse Comitatus Act, he's not allowed to get involved in civil matters. Okay, that doesn't mean he can't hang a judge if he wants to. Of the Army, it's the yes. Provost the United Marshal States Army General the of the United Grand States Army. Grand Army of the Republic was put in charge of the okay. United States government and has never been rescinded. We live under martial rule today. That's why there's been five trading with the enemy acts. The Patriot Act, the NDAA Act, the original trading with the enemy act, the Buck Act. Start looking at the five trading with the enemy acts. Who is the enemy? The United States citizen. Federal government's at war with the citizen. Yeah. This is just too much. I know. You're going to walk out of here like mind blown. Okay. Everything I'm telling you, I can back up with actual documents. Okay. When I learned this, my mind was blown. So I know exactly how you feel. Okay? And it took me 30 years to really learn the depth of the whole thing. And I, we're not even going to touch the surface of it. Barely. What I'm trying to do is boil it down to the simplest, ridiculous, most smallest basic elements so you can make a start in your life of getting out of where you are and getting out of, from under that big thumb that's controlling you, okay? So you can be free. I had a gentleman call me and when I first walked into this building, I sat in that back pew and nobody was in here. And I had a gentleman call me, his name is Jermaine. And he is one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. And about four years ago, four, maybe even five years ago now, I got his kid back from CPS. And then he contacted me and his house was in foreclosure. And I got his house out of foreclosure. And then he contacted me and we put his land in the land patent. And he called me to tell me that he finally realized through the Bible what equity law really means. Mm -hmm. Okay. And after doing all that for him and teaching him for four years, 
he finally hit him. And I said, light dawns on marbled head. Huh? I said, isn't it wonderful? Because I used to tell him, you know that, that guy on the TV show that has the baseball bat with a bobble wire rope? He's one of those guys I needed that with. I needed to just beat it into his brain because he, you know, fairly young guy, he's probably your age. And he'd just been brought up and indoctrinated in life in the school system. And he didn't know any of this stuff. But when I taught him, it's like, oh my gosh, now he owns a piece of property. He doesn't even have to pay property taxes on. He doesn't have to go get a building permit to do what he wants on his property. Nothing. If you look at the United States law, United States code, all property shall be in land patent. All property shall be in meets and bounds. You know how the county steals your house from you? Simple. <laughs> show me a tax statement. I'll show you 15 ways on your tax statement of errors and how they stole your property from you. <laughs> Young husband and wife walks in. They're going to go buy their first home, right? They, they get a mortgage. They go to the title company to buy their first home. And they're sitting there signing all their mortgage documents. And the title officer looks across the desk at them and says, how would you like the whole title? And you guys go look at each other. You know, I don't know. What are our options? And she says, well, most most husband and wives hold title and joint tenants in common. You think about it. Yeah, joint husband and wife. Oh, okay, yeah, that sounds good. Right? And they sign their documents and then they walk out. <coughs> We're homeowners. Joint is husband and wife. Tenants is renter, common estates. Joint renters is estate. That's one way they still do property, and that's not all. Let's look at your tax statement. Your tax statement has your name in all capital letters. Mm -hmm. Your person owns it, not you. Then it's got your address on it. It's got your zip code. <laughs> now they took it out of Arizona and they put it in Washington, D.C. for you, but you're just living on that property temporarily to do business. Mm -hmm. Okay? And now they re-describe your property. They say, oh, that's, that's lot 27 of block three of Spring Hill subdivision, Phoenix, yeah. Arizona. Right? Is that a meets and bounds? Oh, did they break just break United States code by redescribing my property? Yeah. Yes, they did. That's a felony. But they did it anyway, because they're stealing their property on behalf of the state. It's okay. <laughs> no, it's not okay. Then they give it a tax ID and parcel number instead of a land patent number. Mm -hmm. Look up your original land patent under your property. It was probably uh, Arizona's probably a Hidalgo uh, Guadalupe Treaty. You guys probably didn't know that either. Huh? I pull all kinds of crap out of this brain. And that treaty put all this property in land patent. All private property in land patent. Not for the federal government's property. Either. But any private property in land patent. Now your property the land patent was probably this big, and your property is probably this big. Yeah. So you find the land patent that covered where your property sits, and now that's, that's your land patent number that goes on your title, right? Yeah. And then this little tiny parcel, you just describe it with meets and bounds as part of the land, part and portion of the land patent. Put it back in land patent. Get it recorded with the county. No, it's her job to tell the tax assessor, hey, take that off the tax rolls. Mm -hmm. No more property tax. I thought you were going to say put a square around it and then it doesn't matter. <laughs> put a square around it. No, I, I shouldn't <laughs> drew the. No, that's all right. But that's, that's just one way government starts to steal your life equity. Okay, so there's many, many ways. They, the birth certificate get your child title to the state. Now they can walk in without any due process of law, kick your door in, take your kid out of your home. Half the time they don't even use a warrant, even if they do use a warrant. Half the time it's not signed by a judge because there hasn't been any judges in this country since 1789. 
they're all administrators. If you look up the word court in the law dictionary, one of the older law dictionaries, especially like Beauvais or Black's Law Dictionary, if you look up the word court, it says C bank, C post office. All post offices are banks. You can walk into any post office in the United States, buy a US district postal money order, and it is backed by gold and silver, actual real money. It's one of the only real monies besides this stuff that's left in the United States. So a postal money order is backed by gold and silver? Yeah. But no other money orders are? No. They're backed by Federal Reserve notes. And a Federal Reserve note is legal tender. It doesn't even pay off a debt. It tenders it to a later date until one of the estate is settled. So everything you pay with Federal Reserve notes just tenders it till after you die. They receive the, birth, the death certificate and they settle the SESTA-QV trust and balance the books. That's when all your debts are paid. Okay. So you can get the money before that, the credits. As a man or a woman, we are the creditor. Right. Do you know that's originally why they're called credit reports? Yeah. They're not debt reports. They're credit reports. Look at HDR 192. All of our debts, mm -hmm. you know, the bankruptcy of the United States in 1933. Every one of our debts are prepaid. Yeah. Because they're prepaid with the SESTA QV trust upon our debt. But they're essentially prepaid. They're prepaid because the day we were registered, we were bonded and insured. The day we were what? You got to figure out how to. The day you registered your kid, your birth certificate. When your birth certificate was registered, you were bonded and insured. If you were born between 1975 and 1933, you're bonded for $630,000 and you were insured for 1 million. Wow. If you joined the military like I did, you got an additional cuss up number, which is an additional bond and it's an additional insurance policy. Uh -huh. So is your social security card. So is your advanced degree in college, your student ID is an additional cuss up number. It's another bond. We can look up all these cuss up numbers on the internet and I can show you which companies are buying and selling you right now, can't we? because we did that last mm -hmm. night for you guys, see? And we can show you exactly what companies are buying and selling your United States Treasury bonds mm -hmm. that are inside your LEI under your custom numbers. And can if you, you type in your birth certificate before? number, what's that? Can you get those credits before you, you're dead out of the custom to get those resources yeah you, you know why the federal government carries a debt to tie up the SESTA QB trust if the country was debt free and paid their bills any one of us could walk in and get our trust wow but we can't now by claiming the minor account wow we pledged them as the full faith and credit of the United States government and I'm not saying we can't get them <laughs> that's what I want to learn. Okay. That's a long class. Okay. Yeah. Do it through a United States bankruptcy judge and go in as the creditor. Right. Okay. That's very difficult. Have you done it? It's very difficult to do. No, I have not. But how about. Am I close to doing it? Yes. Very close. There's a lot you have to accomplish. See, right. what you have to do is you have to unsell everything you've been sold. Right. That's the first problem. Uh -huh. All those contracts you've created your entire life. You have to get out. You have to unsell them. But you, but you. It's way up here. We're way down here right now. Okay. This is the beginner's group. And I don't say that with any disrespect. Okay. I don't know what level you are. Some are in higher levels than others. It doesn't matter. Yeah. We're all in this thing together. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is they are stealing our kids with no due process. And under the auspices. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're stealing us. Yeah. All, you know how they're stealing us? It's called statutes. Mm -hmm. There's 100, 188 million laws on the books that they call laws, which aren't law, that they hold us accountable of because we're a citizen. 
and they fine us for a misdemeanor or felony. And every time they do, they can go after our SSQB trust fund. The Department of Fiscal Services, and this is all off book money, it's reported on the GAC's off book, okay? The Department of Fiscal Services says the Department of Justice is the biggest contributor to our federal government by far. What's our government budget this year? About $4 trillion. How much do they take into taxes? $990 billion. If you really understand the law, you'll know that even this $990 billion goes to interest paid to the IMF through the IRS, which is not part of our government, to pay on the interest of the bankruptcy of our debts. Okay. Government is funded through our SESTA-QB trusts. How is it funded? There's three ways they can get your money. If you read SESTA-QB trust law, there's three ways they can get your money. They can find you guilty of a misdemeanor or a felony. Mm -hmm. They can take your kids. Then they can go after a husband and wife's SESTA QB trust. Jesus. Or if you die. Now, when you die, here's what happens. It goes into probate. Mm -hmm. Your estate, and I don't, I'm not talking about the Federal Reserve dollars that you put in the bank in your house and your car and your furniture and your trinkets. Mm -hmm. I don't care about that. I'm talking just about the SESTA QB trust. When he goes into probate and a death certificate is received, the estate is balanced. In other words, anything you paid for your whole life with checks and things like that, borrowed money is now paid. They pre the IMF prepays it and they get paid back, essentially. That's what a Federal Reserve note is. It's legal tender, it tenders it to a later date. The IMF is extending you credit every dollar you spend is an extension of credit, your debtor, okay? And all you gotta do is, you don't believe me, read any of the books written by any of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago wrote a wonderful one called Modern Money Mechanics. And you'll see that even if you go buy two, borrow $200,000 from a bank to buy a house, it didn't come out of their, out of their depositors' accounts. It didn't come out of their shareholders of their corporation's accounts. They did a journal entry. It came off of your credit and it's then reported on your credit report. They took the money from you, from the SESTA QB trust, gave it to you to buy the house. Then you pay for it with your sweat equity that you earned your federal reserve notes with. And you paid these payments for 30 years, way more than what it originally was, right? And then you pay it off. Or if you miss 90 days worth of payments, they take it back from you. Everything you paid is lost. And then they resell it again and make their profit again and again. And if you wrote a check for your house payments, every check is a negotiable security. And they resell those 10 times over. So if you write a check for $1,000, they're going to make 10000 just off your check. Because awesome. that's what they're allowed to do. Under tax. You think this isn't usury? Mm -hmm. Fraud? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So read books. <laughs> read books written by the Federal Reserve and learn how money works in this country. It'll blow your mind. That's why I got a silver dollar on my belt buckle. And that's why I carry a gold coin in my pocket at all times. Because I can show a judge I use real money. What do you have to say about now? This is the only real money mm -hmm. right here. You remove your handicaps from them. You use the fourth most important word in the law, which is previously. The fourth most important word in the law is previously. So you got presumption of you being a citizen, a person, a resident, and a minor. I don't talk about minors much because there's none of us have known how to claim our minor account. Okay. And they presume those things, therefore they have jurisdiction over you. And then they assume you did something wrong. Your house was too dirty. I'm sorry, I'm going to take your kid. You smacked your kid. There was a bruise. Maybe you did it. Maybe you didn't. We don't care. Okay. So on and so forth. 
whatever it was. They presume you're a drug dealer when you're not. They presume you broke the speed limit when you didn't. They presume whatever it is. I want to know where the first-hand witness is that swore under the oath of penalty of perjury that you did it what they said you did. Mm -hmm. And there better be two cooperating witnesses. Yeah. Because one ain't good enough. Because I'll tear one to shreds. But I can't tear two to shreds. Now I'm guilty. You see what I mean? <clears throat> Is there perjury? Is there penalty of perjury? Under the penalty of perjury. So we, will we stand upon uh, on the stand and swear an oath? That's, we are now under the penalty of perjury. Will we submit an affidavit to the court? Everything in that affidavit better be true. Or you're in it. Because you're under the penalty but they, of perjury. They get to lie. They get to don't. lie their asses off. And we don't. Oops. <laughs> Come on, Dan. Right? We don't. I gotta be careful. But they can lie, we, we can't. Well, no, they can't morally lie. They, they do. do it anyway. They do. But how do you get them? Because you're an attorney. Attorney. He sat there on his butt. He didn't say anything. He right. didn't say, I object. Hearsay. We rebut that. We repudiate that. It's acquiescence. Uh, if you don't, if they presume and assume the law, which they do, you do, and they try you based upon hearsay, and you don't repudiate it, rebut it, object to it, yell hearsay at the top of your lungs. I want a case where a young man was charged with 18 felonies for doing nothing but trying to defend his wife and kids in his own home. See, I'll tell you about Nathan Kobat. I have a lot of experience with the Kobat family, it seems like, because Jamie Kobat was my first big federal case where I met her after she was already found guilty of four felony counts of fraud. And she didn't spend one day in jail. It saved her 20 years of her life. Okay, that's a big deal. I mean, him after the fact, okay? People don't realize how big a deal that was, that case was. In fact, all the attorneys, all the prosecuting attorneys, all the defense attorneys said, this is Judge Mosman. He's the number one judge in the entire ninth district of the federal court. If you get sentenced, you get sentenced. It's that simple. It's cut and dry. None of them would even go up against him. I said, I'll go up against him. I don't have a problem. I, I can debate any judge or any lawyer. Okay. Because the difference is I know the law. See? And so we submit documents. And then I write a five page document for Jamie to stand up and read there and sentence. Yeah. And you know what he did? I told her exactly what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. He's going to try and do three things. He's going to try and get you to take a public defender. And that pulls you back in his jurisdiction. He's going to try and get you to contract, sign some kind of a plea deal. Or he's going to say, we need a competency hearing. <clears throat> Didn't you go to school from kindergarten through 12th grade and get a diploma? Don't you have a degree in competency from the government? Mm -hmm. Did you get a college degree? You got another degree in competency? I mean, on and on and on. I mean, we can go on forever on how competent we are. All right. Competency is like a last ditch effort for them guys. Okay. And now they've even started to write state code where they find you incompetent. Then they got you. See? So there's lots of different things about this that we've got to understand how to deal with them in the proper language to be in the proper jurisdiction at the time we need to be in that jurisdiction. I had a guy call me this morning at eight o'clock. They're the plaintiff trying to, they're the grandmother and grandfather trying to get their grandkids back. The children passed away. The state took the kids. And they're trying to get their grandkids back. They've been fighting this for a long time. And they want to know if they could use my document. I said, you can use things out of my document, but you can't use my document. Why? Because my document is designed for people who are on the defense in order to go on the offense, because the best defense is a good offense. Okay? That's what it's designed for. But if you're going in as the plaintiff to sue somebody, there's things in the document, certain rights you have in the document, 
that you can use, but the document's not for you if that's the situation. And we talked all about that and I gave him a plan and he's moving forward on the plan. Okay. So that's why Dave has been a little reluctant to willy nilly just throw out my document to a lot of you guys. See, when I was taking an individual and we were taking the document into court, we were when we went started winning just like every single time. It's Prior to that, we were like a 40, 50% win ratio, right? Sometimes we win, sometimes we would lose. And the more I started to incorporate this, understand this document. It's called the never perfect document for a reason because I'm always making it better, all right? But I've also used parts and pieces off this document for many, many years. I just sat down one day and decided we've got to put it all together. Shorten this time frame, shorten it how long these kids are gone, that kind of stuff. And we started using it and we just started winning. Now understand we're dealing with individuals, individual judges, individual prosecutors, individual CPS. You don't know what poker hand they're trying to play. Nobody has a crystal ball. So sometimes you got to push the document a little farther up the ladder, but eventually you win with it. Okay. And you got to get it in the right hands. And up the ladder, what do you mean by that? from CPS, family court, sometimes appellate to Supreme, Superior Court, or take it to federal. In Arizona, I'd just take everything to the federal court. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you got a crooked governor tied into a crooked attorney general right. who's tied into a CEO of a hospital who's stealing kids. Right. And they're all tied together. Right. Okay. And elders. All you gotta do is tell when an attorney general signs personal documents on a personal case, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Because he ain't supposed to do that. All right. And elders too. Uh, how do you, yeah. How do you take, that's the question, how do you take them to the What is the key to that? Each that and what would be it's simple. Get the document judgmented in the lower court and then take it to the federal court to enforce the judgment. And we can judgment our own documents. How? Because they acquiesce. They ignore our affidavits for 21 days, thinking that we aren't smart enough to judgment them on the 22nd day. <laughs> thinking that we're not smart enough to have served them properly. Th you know, thinking lots of things. So I got to teach you how to serve it properly, how to keep a record of proof of service, how to certify that proof of service, how to certify your judgment. Then bind it all together. It's already court stamped and go refile it again. Now you've got a judgment on the record that they can't ignore. The law is pretty clear on unrebutted affidavits become the, becoming the judgment. There's multiple case law on that. Hmm. Okay. Could you repeat that? Yeah. A little loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We hear you back there. We need that. I need you to. Yeah. You mean, I'm sorry. That's all right. Like you said, I've been talking for a week from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Do you need some more water? <laughs> I might. Okay. So. Yeah. About the judgments. Okay. We have an affidavit. We go and we record the affidavit. You should make three, at least three original copies of the affidavit that you go get notarized, same document. You walk in with two copies into your lower court and you, yeah, four, four is fine too, but you walk in with at least two copies and you're going, they're both original. You're going to give one to them and get it put on the record. They're gonna court stamp that, but you want them to court stamp your copy that you take back. That's your proof of the court. You also wanna make copies of those. And up in the top corner, just write certified true copy of the original X in a line and sign your name to it and serve that to every opposing party the prosecutor, the CPS worker, the more people to see it, the better. So make people up, send it to the CEO of the hospital. Um, 
I'm so sorry. I know we went over this last night, but so you take one of the copies back and then you write on top of it, then no, copy you them. make copies make and copies. on top of the copies, you write that. Okay. Because those go to the opposing parties. The minute you file it in the court, you've got to serve the opposing parties. Mm -hmm. Go serve them. And make sure you don't put a box in the Try and get it done that day. Right. That day? Could you, could you start it out as, when you say lower court, um, what, what court's coming after you? The, Who's coming after you? They give you a document, right? And it's the got the court name and, and the, the prosecutor courts. and whoever. Yeah. Whoever's coming after you, that's yeah. the court you're in. Okay. That's who you serve it on first. Uh, do you have to help with the, the appeal case? If you're waiting on appeal attorney? No. No. Appeals look at to see if what the lower court did wrong. They don't care about the details of your case. They don't care about any of that, really. They, they just want to see if the lower court messed up. That's what an appeal is, really. I don't see, ever see many appellate cases getting turned, turning over yeah. lower courts anymore because they're, rubbish. they're all in it together. They're all in it for the same buck. Yeah. I don't feel any trust from it either. It's a it's a petty question. I got everything you said um, the in, instructions, and you know, have three copies at home. But then I have two copies, and I'm in court, and I give one so that the recorder well, can record well, that I gave that one. That's a court clerk, not at a hearing. We're talking about filing it into your court case. So you walk into the courtroom, you walk up to the clerk's office. Well, you can Hopefully serve weeks those before it starts. You can serve those parties in, in tomorrow. Court. Goes, because they're right there. Yeah, but right. that's what I'm talking about now. I'm more confused. Um, I mean, when I'm giving it to the clerk, I give it to the clerk to record and get and get it stamped before the hearing starts or during the Yeah, hearing. hopefully a month or, before. Two weeks before. Oh, oh as, the clerk. As far before okay. as you can possibly get. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I give it to the one the, copy. You to walk the court into the court clerk. clerk's office. Okay. She's the court uh, recorder. Mm -hmm. She's the one that puts the documents yeah. onto your case record. I understand now. I thought you meant okay. in the middle of court so that it's recorded. Yeah. No, I'll tell you why you want to do it as far ahead of time as possible. Yeah. Because hearing is they on won't, they won't trial rebut starts it. Monday morning at nine. Is it That's a severance? Right. I've done it. I've walked into court and done it. Okay. But the sooner the better. Okay. And then Angela, you can pass those out to the other parties right before the court. Here's the right. deal with an affidavit. I didn't hear. Right. What did she say? I, I have a hearing problem, but I also didn't hear another thing. What do I put when I sign it? That's the only last thing I didn't understand. Was but I give the copies for everyone before I go to court, but it has my signature. You, What's you the just certify that it's a true and original copy. True and original copy, that's all. Okay. In other words, I'm done, I heard it. you didn't Except put that. one in the court, and then you went home and go, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. You make some changes and serve it. No, no. Can I? It's got to be a you're swearing this under the oath of the penalty of perjury in the affidavit. So it's got yeah. to be true. It's got to fit you. So my document, you have to take and modify to fit you, your person, a man, woman. And when you mail it that out, what is the best way to mail it out to be certified to protect that thing so that they're still signed and they don't sign it or they just don't even send, they send it back? You need to have some form of proof of service. Okay. Now, you can walk into the prosecutor's office okay. and talk to the receptionist and say, this needs to go to the prosecutor. I need you to sign for the receipt of that. Give me a receipt. That receipt, your proof of service. You are the agent stamp for the principal. No, the only question that I would have is that yeah. when you're serving them, how to take that process. You don't. Anyone over the age of 18 can serve. But what you cannot do is if you're part of the complaint, you cannot normally serve the document because then you're like a line saying, okay, I'm going to give this guy, but it has to be a third party, somebody that doesn't have any say so. So that's a United a, States Postal Service, right. so you, UPS, FedEx, right. tracking number. Okay. Those are, I, I was just going to get into that. You got to, you got to. You've got to have a third party do it like that. So for, with like with her case, that, would she would she give those could she give those 
affidavits right then and there? In court. In court. Oh, okay. Yes, because you've got witnesses. Gotcha. Okay. To it. Okay. You've got the judge. You got the prosecutors. You got them as witnesses. If you're doing it that day, I don't recommend doing it that day. Yeah, I, I think the problem with that is that then the judge can say, "Okay, we cancel the whole thing. We have time to respond." And that's right. And that. And that. By the way, okay. I've used that tactic to buy time. Okay. Because okay. they better read the document yeah. and go over. I walk into court and I grab the document, I hold it up in the air and I say, have you read it? Okay. If you haven't read it, I suggest you suspend this hearing for a later date until you've had a chance. You want to make sure they've read the documents. Okay. Because usually by the time they get down to about that 10th page of the document, they're getting a little fearful mm -hmm. that they're going to be held on charges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, are they really? Absolutely right. Because these, I have personally put a lot of judges and prosecutors in jail. Great. Wow. Okay, they are not immune. I don't care what you think. They are not immune. They're in. The, they're holding a, a position of public trust. Mm -hmm. They're breaking that trust. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to crucify them. Okay. You've probably seen some pretty cool things happen in the last few months, like the entire Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania, yeah. The entire pre Supreme you, you Court of West one? Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Pennsylvania. I didn't You're going to start seeing my buddy Chris Hallett going after emoluments clauses. Emolument is anything that you earn a dollar for in public service mm -hmm. and do not follow their oath of office. Mm -hmm. They can be brought up on emoluments charges. And he, he went before Congress and got permission to do that. So the whole company to do that called e -Clops, LLC. And he goes after judges and prosecutors in the legislature. I just wanted to know what this affidavit is like. How does it help me in this process of going through the appeal process now? My rights have already been severed. I'm just curious. To... Sorry, your rights have already been severed. You're going through the appeal process, and I don't want to burst your bubble <clears throat> by telling you probably not, not a damn thing that's going to happen. I doubt they're over, going to overturn it. It's a very rare occurrence that they overturn a lower court. Unless you can prove that they created some kind of violation, like a Brady violation or something like that. Okay. That's the only time the appellate court is going to overturn anything. If you're trying to base it upon your facts or your case, how about the it's over. Um, the Fourth Amendment? Can't you get it back on fraud? Yeah. More jurisdiction? Oh, yeah. See, here's the purpose of the document. You notice how is there? There's no mm -hmm. detailed facts about your particular case. Yeah. Because the bar association has a model. And the motto is, no fact or truth shall be tried in court. Did you hear that? Did, did you hear that? The Bar Association has a motto. No fact or truth shall be tried in court. It really doesn't matter what the details are of your case. Okay, the other thing is, they have created a system of policies and procedures to screw you up. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, you missed that deadline. Mm -hmm. You didn't file soon enough. Mm -hmm. You didn't file in the right way. You didn't file in the proper form. You didn't. Or wasn't there formal boxes, boxes anyway? <laughs> okay. See, I don't file motions. You know what a motion is? It's a plea. It's a beg. Judge, can we just move this thing along? Will you please rule on this up or down? That explains how legal the two attorneys were. No, attorneys have to file motions. You got to understand, they're working within their labor union. A defense attorney and a prosecuting attorney and the judge, they all go golfing together later. They all go out to lunch. That is a labor union. It's a criminal mafia bar association is what it is. It's a labor union. No state licenses an attorney. Do you understand that? No state licenses an attorney. The Bar Association of the state licenses the attorney. Does that right there tell you they're not part of de jure government? Mm -hmm. 
man, we got to wake up, guys. We all got to wake up and understand how de facto works, what it means. De facto is without fact. Rules, codes, statutes, ordinances, policies, executive orders are not law. They are corporate bylaws. They are de facto. It says that right in the U.S. Code. Okay. What does that truly mean? That means they're operating under the color of law. And because people are good, honest, moral people, even the Supreme Court says this in several cases, because people are good, honest, moral people, we obey things that are not law on the premise that they are. Mm -hmm. okay. Four most important words of law, presumption, assumption, hearsay, and previously. Tell you, I start telling you about Nathan Kobach. Nathan, young, young family, had a couple of little kids, been out of high school about 10 years. He goes into Safeway store and he's in the Safeway store buying some groceries as his wife told him to pick up on the way home. How all wives do. Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I said that. <laughs> anyway, uh, pick up on the way home and he runs into two of his friends from high school he hadn't seen in 10 years. Hey, come on over to the house tonight and we'll have a beer. We'll talk, catch up, right? Stuff a lot of guys do. So his friends come over to the house and they come over. They've probably already had a few. Nathan has them a beer and they all sit around. And they're talking for a while. And one of them's getting very belligerent. And Nathan says, you know, I got two little kids in the bedroom right there. My wife's sitting right here. If you're going to talk that way, I'd just soon you leave. And he started escorting them to the door. And they walk out the door and they walk over down the sidewalk and they walk to the, their car. And one of them gets in and the other one says, I'll be right back. He slams the door and he walks back into the house and he walks up to Nathan and he grabs Nathan by the throat and he pulls him up against the wall. And the guy's quite a bit bigger than Nathan. He's a big dude. And he's got Nathan by the throat. So Nathan, he's a concealed weapons permit holder. He reaches in here, he grabs his pistol, and the guy sees it. And he grabs his arm and holds it up in the air. And he chokes Nathan out until Nathan falls to the ground, passed out. And his wife is watching him. And his wife's screaming, trying to beat on this guy. But he's a big dude. I think he's bigger than this guy right here. You're a pretty big dude. Okay. And then the guy leaves. Goes and gets in his car after he sees Nathan lying on the ground and he leaves. So his wife runs over. She's shaking Nathan awake. Takes her a little while. Once Nathan wakes up, she says, call the cops. 911. And the wife makes a mistake. She goes, you probably ought to take your shoulder holster off and your pistol and put it in the bedroom. So the cops come over and they take Nathan's statement. They go over and they arrest the two guys, take them into jail, and they go and interrogate them. And they find out Nathan pulled a gun. And Nathan, Nathan didn't, and his wife didn't tell him about the gun. So now they go back to Nathan's house, they arrest him. And we have this very liberal governor named Kate Brown. And anybody that uses a gun at any point, even if they're just defending their family and in their own home, she says, throw the book at them. So they charge Nathan with 18 felony counts, right? So anyway, Jamie goes to a family reunion. And at the family reunion, she hears Nathan's story. She hadn't talked to Nathan in five years or more. And she hears Nathan's story, and Nathan says, yeah, I'm probably going to jail tomorrow. I have court tomorrow morning. And Jamie shakes him and says, you better call David straight. He says, it's 11 o'clock. She says, call David, he's up. He calls me at 11 o'clock the night before his trial. He's got a public defender, and his wife is scared to death and won't let him fire his public defender, because that's the first thing I always tell everybody. Fire your damn attorney. If you got an attorney, there's nothing I can do to help you, really. Okay. And his wife will want to fire the attorney. 
So I spent about two hours on the phone with Nathan teaching him the basics of law, kind of like what I'm doing right here. And of course, you're not going to get very far on the phone the night before a trial, right? So I called Jamie up and I said, Jamie, I know it's midnight. By then it's probably one o'clock. I said, you need to go to Nathan's trial tomorrow because I can't. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to call Nathan first thing in the morning, tell him to call his attorney to meet an hour before court. And he did. And Jamie showed up and I said, Jamie, here's what I want you to do. You walk up to the attorney and you say, we're gonna have a little problem here unless you do exactly what I tell you to do right now. Now attorneys don't like to hear that, right? And he says, she says, I'm gonna bring you up on criminal charges as soon as this thing is done, unless you do what I'm about to tell you to do. Every word that comes out of the prosecutor's mouth, I want you to say hearsay. I want you to object to it. I want you to rebut it. I want you to repudiate it. And it better be every single line because I'm gonna be sitting over there watching you. And I'm gonna take notes. And if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm filing criminal charges against you tomorrow. And don't think we all have a list of charges we can put against any attorney. Bar attorney for one. Look it up, it's named after the Bar Association. Okay. We'll read Title 18 of the United States Code. There's a big long list in there. Okay. And so the attorney would look over at Jamie and Jamie would look right at her like that. Every time the prosecutor says something, she'd object, she'd yell hearsay, she rebutted it. She, she did a great job. And they said, all right, it's time for the defense. The prosecutor presented their case. Now it's time for the defense. And the defense stands up and says, there was no firsthand witnesses. There was no affidavit. Police officer is not a firsthand witness. We objected to everything there was. Nathan, are you innocent? Yes, I'm innocent. That's the only word that he said. And we rest. And then the judge dismissed the jury to go deliberate. Everybody gets up, walks out of the courtroom, they get out in the hallway. And the judge says, come on back. Everybody walks back in. They thought they were going to lunch. They walk back in, the jury comes out and says the state did not present a case. He's innocent on all charges. 18 felony counts of fraud. But he did that with an attorney. Yeah, he did it with an attorney. But an attorney would have sat on their butt oh, and God. said nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's how powerful a word hearsay is. When everything is hearsay, everything is presumption and assumption. If that's all you know how to do, you can defend yourself. If that's all you know how to do, that's very, very important to learn. What's that? Hearsay. Hearsay. I object. I rebut that. I repudiate that fact. Get your theosaurus out. <laughs> Find every every your, every you know, every word that connects to hearsay. Right. <laughs> yes, yes bullshit. Forgetting the fact that the reason why they're saying it is so it goes in the court record. We said, okay, we got for an appeal. It should happen. That's probably what's happened years. I don't have an appeal because they didn't object properly. They don't want to hear any new information. And the last part of the thing is it's got to be something that's new to discover evidence, then the appellate court will look at that, okay, as part of the appeal. But here, the reason why you say you have said it, it's got to be on the court record, so then you get the copy of the thing on top of that recording for 10 bucks, and then you can work with it. Yeah, but most time that you're, if you've got a jury, they'll understand that the state didn't, couldn't, didn't present a case. Well, if you stand up and you say there was no first-hand witnesses, there was no evidence, there was no, you know, a police officer is not a first-hand witness. They get there after the fact. Was he there when Nathan pulled his gun? Was he there when Nathan got choked out? No, he wasn't standing in the living room having a beer with the rest of the guys. 
Okay, so. I have a question. Um, I have an attorney that I keep wanting to bring Melinda in as my ADA advocate, and he just keeps, will not let her in. What can I do to- Don't have an attorney and don't have an advocate. I love advocates, but don't have them in court. No one can know your case and present your case like you. So you gotta grow up and be a woman. Gotcha. Stop being a person, a citizen, a resident, a minor, be the woman, the living soul, the daughter of God that you were intended to be and speak for yourself. That's number one. That's the first thing you gotta do. Because when you have an attorney, you are a ward of the court. You're unable to speak for yourself. You're declared incompetent. <laughs> Okay. It's David, just in the very nature of it. David, these yeah. two women have the same, um, they have guardian ad litems. Um, they have appointed attorneys plus guardian ad litems. Mm -hmm. They have, she has six psych psychological reports that say that she is completely competent. There's nothing wrong with her. She has a lot of good evidence in her corner. But these guardian ad litems, these yeah, guardian ad litems yeah. are just standing by raking in the dough based on false yeah, allegations. Every one of those are a con job. Yeah. yeah. Every one of them. So when she fires her lawyer in the court, I mean, the court made her sign a letter saying that she would not ask for any more lawyers. <laughs> Good. That's not really proof, though. No. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was just outrageous. Good. It just was like, fire your lawyer. Me? I think they said it. If they say, no, you got to have a public defender. No, I am sued jurist. No, I am sued jurist. Right. No, I'm sued jurist. How do you spell that? S U I G U R I S. J J U R I S. S U I J U R I S. What's that? Yes. And that means. Jurors uh, means jurors means yes. right. They don't wrong. help anything. I'm alone. Because they yes. Sue means Sue means you're 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 a non-representative yeah. agent of yourself. You're, you're over yourself. just for, you're 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 over your own jurisdiction, not the venue jurisdiction of the court. What is yeah. stop worrying about your personal details. Okay. You go after them on jurisdiction yeah. and fraud. Yes, yes. right. The only two things without statute of limitations, I don't care if you're 20 years into a life sentence, you could go back on your uh, jurisdiction of fraud and avoids it from the beginning, ab initio, right from the beginning. Got three people out of jail that way just in the last year. Okay? And the record's gone. I mean, wiped off the face of the year is gone. You look up their court cases, it says does not exist. Why? Because they don't want this fraud exposed on the public record and some law student at Cornell or Yale or Harvard finding it and going, holy shit, we can win every case now. <laughs> right. exactly. You know how much money I can make? Yeah, yeah. they don't want that, that, that memo. They don't want it on the record. Right. So my job is to get it on as many records as we possibly can, as fast as we possibly can, so as many people find it as fast as we can, and then the attorneys are going to eat their own. It's going to self-destruct from the inside. Mm -hmm. This bar association is going to go away. Mm -hmm. We can walk up to President Trump and say, ha, see what we did? Please now stop. let's denounce the treaty with the bar association. See, mm -hmm. constitutions and treaties, okay, I'm going to start at the beginning. God's law is superior, superior law, superior law. Constitutions and treaties are supreme law, and everything else is way down here. It's the dirt on the ground. Okay. It's now corporate bylaws. See, Congress, the Constitution in the United States says only Congress can pass laws. Yeah. They, they haven't passed a law since 1860. And they haven't been ratified. All they pass is statutes. Every act of Congress has a line in it that says, this act shall not affect any rights thus previously established. That Before means that 18, you have the, yeah. Abe Lincoln. Thank you. Yeah. I just told you, Abe Lincoln. Mm -hmm. He incorporated the United States. 
Okay. Every act of Congress has that line. This act shall not affect any rights thus previously established. What does that mean? That means Congress doesn't pass any ex post facto laws. None. Every act of Congress since then is a corporate bylaw. That's why the Supreme Court says rules, code, statutes, and ordinances are not law. And they say that in multiple cases. Read Hale versus Henkel, 1906. It's been upheld by the courts 1,600 times. It's the most upheld case there is. And it, you know what it's telling you when you read it? Exactly what I'm telling you standing up here. I could have just repeated Hale versus Henkel and probably told you everything that I'd tell it. Okay, and a wonderful case. And that's just one. There's hundreds of them. This law shall not affect any rights previously Thus previously established. established. That means our rights were established as a de jure government. The de jure government never died. It's within all of us if we want to claim it. If we want to be the Arizona, the man. But you the first have to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but one of the things is do you first have to establish your status? Establish your status. What does the United States Code say? The United States Code says we have to notify the Secretary of State. Right. Via affidavit. If we don't do now, that, John Kerry, when he was in office, he says, I don't want to see any of those affidavits. You do it through the passport agency. Okay. And it's all in how you fill out the DS 11. Okay. There's a right way and a wrong way to fill out the DS 11. If you fill it out one way, you're going to be a U.S. citizen. If you fill it out another way, you're going to be in state national. I mean, a na U.S. national. If you fill out it another way, you're going to be what they call us state nationals, which is non-resident aliens, because we're non-resident alien of the District of Columbia. See, the United States, USA Inc. and United States Inc., those are actually USA Inc. a French foreign corporation. Okay? They're all privately held companies, corporations. I signed something like that to join something called the Great Jury. And um, I have to find out what I saw <laughs> because I don't know what I am now. <laughs> hey, a state national under Title 8, 1101A, A21 is your lawful designation. Title 8, 1101, Section 1101A21. That's your lawful designation as a state national. When you're a state national, according to the Geneva Conventions, you have limited diplomatic immunity. What does the word limited mean? It means if you don't harm someone or their property, you're fine. You live in freedom. So when you harm somebody or their property, now you're held in the, under common law, which has much stiffer penalties, by the way. So if you are going to harm somebody or hurt somebody, you'd probably be better off under admiralty. Some of these guys that murder people get a slap on the wrist in five years and they're out. Under common law, they'd be hanged. Yeah. Even yeah. if it's for self defense? No, that's, that's not, not murder. murder. Self defense is not murder. I'm sorry, you're contemplating. No. You know what self defense is, right? Self defense is when a CPS worker comes up and she works for a private, for profit business and you put a bullet between her eyes when she's stealing your kids. That's self-defense. Now, defending yourself against that's pretty hard. That's a different story. But that's truly what self-defense is. The Second Amendment was there to protect us from the tyranny. Yeah. Okay. And if we use that... Judge Napoleon anyway, says that really well. If we talk about uh, retribution of any kind, you know, we're very... Careful oh, about that. That's because you've got to be a sweet little citizen. That's right. Good little citizen. <laughs> your social security number is your subservient slave ID right. number. Right. That's oh. why they want us to be silent. Yeah. They want you to be silent. They don't want you to post it on Facebook. They don't want you to do that kind of stuff. They tell you that. They make you sign a contract saying you won't do it. You know what I do? Yeah. I sign the contract and put it out twice as much as you were going to. Oh, yeah. Because if we don't start standing, see, when we give them an inch, well, we're really nice, that police officer, when he stands up. Now, I'm not saying be mean. I smile at them, ask them how their day is, all that kind of stuff. It's how you treat them. Yeah. But you have to say, 
officer, do you know under Title 18, Section 242, that you're depriving me of my rights, which is a felony, under the color of law? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's two of them. Then you use 241 too. <laughs> and then if you want to bring up 19, Section 19, or, yeah, 1983, under Title 18, 1983, it says you can charge the officer. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Wow. Well, I'm telling you, they're, they're, they commit multiple felonies every time they deal with you. And the list of felonies is long. I mean, I printed off 134 felonies that a judge has does commits just putting you through a trial. 134 different felonies to get you on a misdemeanor. <laughs> now, how's that feel? The whole thing sucks. <laughs> what sucks is our lack of education. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, they should have taught us this stuff in school. You know how powerful I'd be if I were to learn what I know now at 25? Oh, yeah. Or, age 20. Oh, <laughs> or when I got out of the Navy? Yeah, I told my son, you're not going to a regular college. So forget it. I'm not paying for it. <clears throat> Go get... Go get a college. trade. <clears throat> Go get a trade and then read books. Let me tell you a quick, short version story of my naval career. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you for your time. When I joined the Navy, I tested a little bit high. <laughs> and I was a damn good shot because I grew up on 3,000 acres and I could take out a gopher a long ways away. Why? Coyotes, anything that harmed our animals, I could take them out. Grew up a farm boy. And so what did they do? They shipped me down to San Diego. They put me in the Navy SEAL training program. And it was during Ronald Reagan's war on drugs. And I was shipped to a, a put aboard a ship off the coast of Panama. I was stationed out of Panama. And we would jump in these life rafts, Zodiacs, <laughs> yeah. with a 50 caliber machine gun and, and uh, some other small arms. And we would go up these rivers, right? Mm -hmm. And we'd duck under the trees that would overhang the rivers and we'd sit and wait. And pretty soon, the Navy would send a bunch of Marines in the helicopter over these drug hostages. They'd land out in the jungle about three or four clicks away. And the, Marines would work their way up to the drug front of the drug posse and is they'd engage the drug army. Okay, that, that drug dealer's army. They had pretty good armies too, by the way. And we'd sit there on the river and we'd hear all the guns going off. And we'd start watching the pathways coming down the river. And pretty soon the drug dealer and a couple of his guys are running down these paths and they're jumping into a boat on the river. That's where we were. See, one day I'm standing on the boat and we're just about ready to engage. They're right there, they're climbing in their boat. We're just about ready to engage. And boom, I get hit in the chest. I'm wondering, what the heck was that? I mean, did a bird fly into me? You know, adrenaline's flowing pretty high. When the adrenaline's flowing high, you don't feel stuff. Yeah. And I went like this and I felt something. I pulled this bullet out of my out of my breastbone and I put it in my pocket. It was stuck in my breastbone. Wow. And I engaged and we started firing. And we had a dossier on everybody. And we formed these dossiers on all these drug dealers. And certain ones, we're supposed to take them out. Okay. And others that we just arrest. But certain ones, we're supposed to take them out. Well, the bullet was one of our own Marines bullets. It probably came up through the trees, bounced, it didn't have a lot of energy. It just left a bruise about that big and one little trail of blood going down to my belly button. And it's hot in Panama, so we were wearing black t-shirts. <laughs> Navy SEALs can wear whatever they want, right? They used to be able to. <laughs> anyway, we went through this. I fired, I had carried this bullet around for like 20 years in my pocket until a hole in the pocket, I lost it. Oh. Yeah, it's like a souvenir. I'd reach yeah. in my pocket and I just kind of feel it every once in a while, you know? But 
To make a long story short, what happened is I had a commanding officer and this commanding officer was telling us to kill people that weren't on our list, on our dossier. And I didn't feel good about it. I've always grew up to be a moral, righteous, honest man. So I didn't feel good about it. So I disobeyed a direct order, I turned him in. We all get hauled to Virginia. I spent a couple of years there in Virginia, in JAG, testifying against this guy. And the court case didn't take a couple of years, but I spent a couple of years in Virginia. And I got a choice. I could come work for JAG. They thought I'd be good at it. Obviously, no one I know now, I probably would have. But then all I wanted to do is go home. Or I could go home. No honorable discharge, no dishonorable discharge. In the military, you're even crucified for doing the right thing and you're disobeying a commanding order for the right reasons. You're still crucified, you disobey the uh, commander order. But it was the right thing for me to do, okay? You have to fight corruption wherever it lies. Smite evil down wherever it exists. And that's what I did. Now I could have stayed in the Navy, got an honorable discharge and went to work for Jack, which is what they wanted me to do. But I wanted to go home. So I went home. And I went back to school and I started a bunch of businesses and I got very successful. And then the housing market hit, I lost nine million bucks. Pretty much everything I've worked for for 35 years. Okay, so there's my story. Anyway, the point of the matter is we have to stand up. We've got to fight corruption. We've got to do the right thing every single time. And the problem with America right now, why we're where we are today, is we were taught to obey authority and not question it. Don't question authority. Listen to your teachers. That's what you're told. I want you to go home and research everything I'm telling you. I don't care. I'm not lying to you. Go research it. Learn on your own. Question everything and hold people accountable to it. Because when you give them an inch, they take a mile. And our government's kind of like this. You give them this much and they take this much. <laughs> and on and on and on. Yeah. And now we're where we are today where they can walk in your house or you go, let's talk about Obamacare for a minute. Really you ever read the Obamacare Act? <laughs> well, who I could? Who could ever? You can. It's 1,300 pages. You can read it in a day. There is no doctor patient confidentiality. They expanded the medical coding system dramatically. Okay. Doctors had to pay like $85,000 for the computer program when this thing passed and hire people in the doctor's office in order to learn how to code everything. So the doctor, he's, he's supposed to give patient care. So he goes and he talks to you and you say, oh, my son's got, he's bipolar or he's got ADHD. It doesn't matter. Any kind of uh, uh, mental illness is just one thing. It could be physical illnesses too, whatever. And the doctor just writes a note. And he hands it to this gal. And this gal sitting at the computer. She puts it in the medical code that corresponds with that note. And the hospital's got CPS agents down in the rent office space. And they got a judge down there, too. Oh, no. In the building. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Children's Phoenix yeah. Hospital has oh, CPS yeah. offices and a judge in the building. In the hospital? In the, in the hospital. hospital. Right in the hospital. Wow. And in most hospitals in the United States now, at least the bigger ones, Anyway, and what happens? You say second opinion, and that's cool. Certain codes are flagged. The minute they're flagged, somebody sitting there in the CPS office looking at her computer screen gets a flag. She gets on the elevator. Or maybe she thinks it's serious enough. She runs over to the judge's office. She says, Here, sign this. And then she gets on the elevator and she goes up, and now you can't see your kid anymore. 
You're escorted out. You're escorted out by as escorted out by two security guards and two policemen. Where was the due process? It was no, no process. Did the parent no get charged with the crime? No. Did she do anything wrong? No. Was there a sworn witness no. that she did something wrong? She asked for a second opinion. Yeah. That's when she that, didn't believe the doctor. That's perceived as a threat. They circle the wagons. And then uh, they, if they feed your child to DCS, I want they, have no, they, have, no, they okay. have no they have no liability. And I then they can feed your child to they can everybody feed you to deal DJ. with from the CPS agent to the CEO of the hospital. I want to know their name, what kind of car they drive, where they live. Their phone I have numbers. Some, some, I have a lot they of information from because we're going to sue them. I have we're a lot put of them in jail. information from a children's. Yeah. Okay. From. Um, on her house in a period of less than two years. I want to know how Judge Ann Aiken can own a 3,000 acre ranch in Montana in an unincorporated county on a judge's salary. Well, Surrounded because... by people who are actors and movie stars who are buying those same ranches for 30 million a pop. Right. How does she get hers? Well, because they are they're purchasing it for her. We've caught them in the let, let me tell you something else. Yeah. Let, let me tell you something okay. about Jamie Kovat's federal case. Okay. She was charged with felony, 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 four felonies, fraud, 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 and wire fraud. She didn't commit any of those felonies, by the way. All four felonies had to do with her autistic son getting SSI, TANF benefits, pre-SSI on her child because he was autistic. 15 years of fighting in court cases because her ex-husband worked for the sheriff's department as a mechanic and he took them all bonus. And when, after they got divorced and they were fighting over their kid, he married the district attorney in the county. And they were crucifying her. And they do all kinds of things like one September, when he got his visitation and he had to go to his dad's for two weeks, his dad enrolled him in school. Then later they used that against him, but he was living there and she was getting benefits. She kept him maintained a room for him, bought him clothes, bought him a computer. When he could turn 16, and she taught him how to drive and how uh, bought him a little car. I mean, she did all kinds of stuff in support of her child. Mm -hmm. He always had plenty of food and a roof over his head and electricity and all the things a mother would give their child. Mm -hmm. She didn't deny him of anything. She was a very good mom. Not only that, she's a good grandmother. She's got 15 grandkids now. Okay. And she raised eight children. He was just one. Mm -hmm. Well, the district attorney fed the, her buddy, the federal prosecuting attorney, a whole bunch of crap and lies, mm -hmm. including a letter that was supposed to be, uh, come from her husband. Uh, he wrote down all kinds of bad things about her and gave her this letter. And they crucified her in court with this letter. He didn't even show up to testify. And then we find out later he didn't write the letter. It wasn't in his handwriting. That was a conversation he had with somebody over the telephone and she was overhearing it. And, and he was saying all these bad things, which weren't true, by the way. Over that period of time, she had four police reports against him. One time he showed up at her house, which she moved three hours away from him, and she, he showed up at her house at two o'clock in the morning, snuck in her house, took the kid, put her in, him in the car, and she heard the car start. She ran out, she put her hands on the trunk, and he runs over with the car, oh, man. right over the top. Okay, fortunately, no wheel hit her, no tire hit her. But it knocked her down and bruised her several places because the axle hit her and the gas tank hit her. And, you know, ran over with the car. And you know what? She turned in these police reports and they didn't do anything about it. Why? Because the DA was his wife and he worked for the sheriff's department. So, you know. And this went on and on and on. So she got indicted. 
And right at the bottom of the indictment, it says a true bill, by the way. I started to tell you this about courts all being banks. Judges are bankers. They're postmasters. They're administrators. They're not judges at all. Attorneys are actors, and they're there to a turn. A turn means to take your property and give to another. Okay? Now, I read her court transcripts. I met her after her trial, after she was found guilty of all four felony counts. The prosecutor prosecuted her for three and a half days, and the defense took two hours, and the jury took 30 minutes, and she was found guilty. And now that she was found guilty on the 8th of April, I met her on the 30th of April, and she was scheduled for sentencing on the 13th of July. So I had between May 1st and the 13th of July to teach her. So I had her and her husband bring their motorhome up and park it in my town in Walmart parking lot. And every day when I got done with my ranch chores, I ran over there and I started teaching her. And the whole time I'm on the phone with other people and trying to help other people and I'm trying to teach her and we're up night and day sometimes. Her and her husband, her husband's a great researcher. Tim's an awesome guy. He's, a, he's ex army special forces and he's a great guy and he's a good researcher. But I'll tell you what, he obeys orders. So he didn't want her to do what I was telling her to do, but she didn't listen to him, which is a good thing. She listened to me. She did what I told her to do. She learned. She, we filed her affidavits. And then she stood up in sentencing. She read five pages <coughs> and she wasn't sentenced. In fact, the judge removed two of her felonies that first sentencing day and then rescheduled sentencing for 30 days. And as we walked out of the hallway of the federal courthouse building, a young judge ran out after us. I said, what did you do? What did you have her say? I can't believe I heard those words. And he says, I got to tell you, I watched Judge Mosman because that's who I've been trying to learn from. I've watched him in as many cases as I get a chance to sit in his courtroom and watch. And never once have I seen somebody walk out of sentencing when they're sentenced or sentenced. That's what he said. When they're sentenced or sentenced by him. Mm -hmm. And she walked out, she went home. 30 days later, we came back. She read her five pages again. Same five and told him again, right? And he did the same thing he did the first time. You want an attorney? You want an attorney? You know, he wasn't that polite about it. But he removed another felony. Now she had one left. I think he did this to drag it on Mm -hmm. so, so that he, he could he try and make her contract, so he could try and make her get her he money, he or she could, he could figure a way mm -hmm. to pull her back in. Mm -hmm. And then went to another sentencing. Not only had that first judge never seen him walk out once, but you should have seen him chase us down the street the second time. He wanted to know everything that I know. Okay, And then all four felony counts were dropped. She didn't spend one day in jail, and she was originally facing 20 years, minimum sentence. Yeah. Minimum sentence. Can we talk about what she said to the court at that, those five pages? It's basically content. written into that document, pretty much. Okay. Mm -hmm. so Great. It's basically the same Great. stuff. Great. Okay. And that's all it is. It's standing up for yourself. It's saying, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm sued jurist, I'm not a citizen, a person, a resident. And you just tell them over and over and over until they you pass the rule of three and you and then you are. Can you do okay. this in a courtroom without the affidavits on your own? If you go into court on Monday morning, it's much more difficult, but yes. And if they okay. start saying so if you fire yeah, your lawyer. Yeah. You fire your lawyer who's not doing anything, who's yeah. sending you fire excuses. Fire for a cause. Here. Because the lawyer is saying, I can't do that. We can't go, we can't that. revisit the beginning of the case. We Tell can't what, do that. Okay, yeah. fire him for a cause, please. What? Hold on for a minute. Oh, sorry. There's jurisdictional bear traps. That's what I call them. They're going to try and throw jurisdictional bear traps all over. And you have to be careful not to get it. Step in one. 
get trapped, okay? That's what they're gonna do. So the first thing you gotta do is listen carefully to every word that's said. And you gotta object or repudiate, yell or hearsay, not fall for their jurisdictional bear traps. Here's how a judge gets jurisdiction. And I started seeing this. I don't know if I said it completely. Did I say it completely? What? Star, when the judge walks in the room, Star says. right off the bat, don't stand. if you stand, your tacit agreement of being a citizen. Don't stand. Eventually, he gets around to your attorney and calls you by name, right? He says, stand up and state your name and address for the record. And you stand up and you yeah, go, David, David Lester Street. And he hears the all caps name that's written on his paper sitting on his desk, right? So now you just cast an agreement that you're a person. There's no way to distinguish the two. In my court, they never let me say that I'm present. I never say I'll, I'll tell you why in just a second. Because you have an attorney. Yeah. You're already in their jurisdiction. Okay. That's one reason, okay? I'm talking about if you walk in and you say you are, <laughs> but they're not gonna believe you on the first time anyway. They're gonna try and pull you in, okay? But then you say your address, you route your address off without any care of rural router with the zip code. Now you're automatically a resident. They already assume you're a minor. They got jurisdiction. If you have an attorney, it's too late. You already, you're yeah, already in your jurisdiction just from the mere fact of hiring. Anytime you hire somebody to represent, you're representing your person, you're lost. You've lost. Okay, they can do whatever they want to. It doesn't mean some attorneys aren't good. They might win an occasional, you know, bone or something yeah, that bone. gets thrown to them. It's a bone. But it's not their job. A bone's going to get thrown to the defense attorney, especially a public defender is being paid out of your SESTA QB trust. Mm -hmm. The court doesn't give anything for free. The government doesn't give anything for free. The government's not paying for your public defender. Right. It's coming out of your SESTA QB trust. See, the lower courts sell everything to the federal district courts. The federal district court, court clerk types in an SF-273 form, which is called a bid bond form, into the Department of Fiscal Services. And that's an order to begin to liquidate the U.S. Treasury bonds that are in your SESTA QB trucks. That's what a bid bond is. Okay, they're putting in a bid. Bid bond. Then, the, then upon your trial, and they do that right off an indictment or stealing your kids or whatever. I understood all of that when you were talking about it before. But. Yeah, but then when you get tried like Jamie was, and could, at the day of her trial, as soon as that trial ended, the court clerk's downstairs. Mary is downstairs and. Mosman's court, and she's typing in an SF-274 form, which is called a performance bond. That's telling the treasury that you're gonna have to perform, <laughs> okay? Then a sentencing comes around and she's sentenced. Now they put in a payment bond and the US treasury wires the money within 24 hours, sometimes the same day if it's early enough in the day. And the court gets paid. And on all four felony counts of fraud, that court would have got $2 million for each court. Now, guess what? We did our research and the judge would have got 95,000 in what's called net retention. Oh, retirement, payments. right? Retirement payments. Net retention payment for each count. That's 480,000 to the, oh. or 380,000 to the judge. Wow. The prosecuting attorney, $50,000. That's 200000 the prosecuting attorney. So you know what they do? They take some money and they write a check and they hand some to the defense attorney. And everybody's happy. Mm. That's why they keep Our association is the labor union. Mm. They all work How do together. they get their money, though? Do you, only when he retires? Out of the Sustic QB Trust. Only when he retires, he gets the 380000 No. Mm. 24 hours. You can get it off a debit card. <laughs> Gee whiz. Okay. So, David, That's one know. case, eight million, <coughs> another three hundred eighty thousand, and another two hundred thousand for being found guilty of four felony counts of fraud. Now, you want to know the definition of railroading? I'll show you because we can go on fidelity.com on the day of her indictment and I can show you 
on. I've got the documents. I can show you the actual dates that were put in the computer for her bid bond or payment bond and, and her bid bond payment, uh, performance bond and payment bond. My tongue is getting tight. And I can show you the actual dates on fidelity.com, which has nothing to do with the court system, that correspond with the date of her trial and the date of her sentencing. They still got the Before money. Before the trial and sentencing even happens. And they got the money regardless. I can show you where those days. They got the money regardless. No. Oh. No, I cost them a bunch of money that day. <laughs> and that's what I'm hoping to do with every case. We'll just keep costing them a bunch of money. And pretty soon, these bar association guys won't be allowed to, they won't have the money to pay their student loans. Okay. Mm. They can all go bankrupt for all care. See, when you find the depth of the fraud, mm -hmm. the way I found the depth of the fraud, when I pulled up on the Department of Fiscal Services website and look at the sample sheets, do you understand that the general public doesn't go to the Department of Fiscal Services website? What for? <laughs> Why would you? No, it's designed for court clerks all across the nation. And the Department of Fiscal Services says the Department of Justice is the biggest fundraiser of the federal government by far. And if you look at the GAC reports, you'll see, because there will be 30 pages of Department of Justice reports, and there will be three pages of all the other agencies, how much money they raised by far. Department of Fiscal Services, you want me to tell you how big it really is? Mm -mm. Says that they raise over a trillion no. a day. A day? No, no. That's more than 25 days, more than one month in courts throughout this country than our gross domestic product in a year. Oh. <laughs> it's a trillion dollar a day industry. Well, you know, you just go into the ticket, ticket courts, you know, that they're just cha-ching. And then every, I, every, I mean, I'm a court watcher, so I will watch uh, judges prosecuting people and saying, okay, um, here, you, you know, you're going to go, you're going to do a plea and do you understand and blah, blah, blah. And it's just cha-ching, cha-ching. It, it's like $200, $200 for an assessment, you know, $400 for your attorney. $65 a month for 18 months for probation. Just go to traffic fee, court fee, 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 for four hours and they'll collect $30,000 in a small traffic court county. Yeah. yeah. In Tucson, there are 12 windows. Not, and not just just that. We have a famous city in Tucson called Laurel Valley and it made national news and they built the whole city on traffic <laughs> But see, that's even a small portion compared to what they're taking out of access to QBs. And when they find you guilty of a misdemeanor or felony, or they take your kids, or you die. So and you should be able free. to get your QB money. That's that would be good. That's another class. I know. Quit going there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to that. She said something very important just now that I bet nobody Melinda? caught on. Yeah. What? Do you understand? Yeah. No. Anytime a judge asks you if you understand, you say absolutely not. I do not understand. I do not understand I these proceedings. I do not understand one. anything. I, I do one. not stand under your statutes. Oh, you okay. Law understand means to stand under. So when they say I don't understand, then they call in the uh, the, the psychological evaluation. I don't care. That's easy to pass. Yeah. Okay, confident is easy to pass. That's a, those are last ditch efforts you for know the where court. you are. But you don't have to okay. take the I got a degree in competency. In fact, I got six of them five college degrees and one high school diploma, which were all degrees of competency. So if they try and declare me incompetent, well, I'm going to ream them all. Okay. Yeah, but they give you drugs in elders. So no, they're not competent. They can't, can't give you drugs. They do. I know. But that is an international felony. Whoa. An international oh, felony. So Look up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the ICCPR. Go ahead. I am getting messages that everybody talking is interrupting me. So just to be sure, after you're done, will you do question and answer? Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Either way, I don't, I don't care. Sometimes it throws me off track, but okay. you know, as it's going to do, because it's good. See, on one hand, it's the stuff you need to know. You're asking about it, so obviously that's what you want answers to. Yeah. I'm here to help you, so I'll try and give you those answers. On the other hand, yeah, it throws off my train of thought sometimes, but I, I always get back around to the basics, <laughs> regardless. So. You know, the basics are there. They're the basics are the basics. Once you learn them, they don't leave you. And once you learn them, you're free. Yeah. I got to tell you, there's nothing like in the world to be free. Yeah. To drive down the road with your passport, to how to handle them. You know, I got a letter that was written in 1985 from an Arizona senator telling the police departments of Arizona that it's perfectly legal to use a passport on the roadways. And if somebody, if you encounter anyone, let them go. And if you don't understand the law, the Senator says, come to someone who knows it and I'll teach you. <laughs> he meant him. He was telling the police officers this, okay? Most cops learn this stuff anyway. I mean, I guess I rarely get stopped because they'll pull my license plate on my truck, but sometimes when I'm in rental cars, I'll get stopped because you know, I don't care too much about their statutes. <laughs> and I like to, it's my opportunity to teach. That's my theory. Okay. So anyway, I was in Utah and I was going to go see somebody in jail in Duchesne County, Utah. And I almost to town and I come up this hill and I go around the sharp corner and there's a cop sitting there. I'm probably doing 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. Mm -hmm. And I see him whip out. So the first thing I do, here's how I throw him off every time. I put my brakes on and I pull over as quickly as I possibly can, as safely as I can. Now he has no time to run my place. Yeah, and then I roll the pasture stop. window all the way down. And he walks up to the pasture window, right? I say, hey, how you doing? How, how's your day going? I'm the nicest guy in the whole world, right? And he says, do you have a driver's license, proof of registration insurance? I say, of course I do, officer. Doesn't everybody? I use them every time I'm driving my Uber. <laughs> but right now I'm traveling. And I'm <laughs> private in my private automobile. Here's my passport. It's the only documentation I use. And I have it. And his job is to look at the picture and make sure it's me. Although I wish I looked like that now. I'm getting old. And say, have a nice day, sir. Be on your way. I won't detain you any longer. That's what he's trained to say. Have a nice day. I will not detain you any longer. You think they're all in training to do that? Well, someone missed class that day. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your opportunity to teach. So if you need to teach, the first paragraph is a commandment from the Secretary of State. I read it to you a little while ago. Okay. It's a commandment from the Secretary of State saying, all who concern, that's him, to the citizen or national, national's me, named herein to pass without delay or hindrance. He <laughs> better not take time to go get on his computer and pull my record for some statute, because I don't care. Okay. And in case of need to offer all lawful aid and protection, that means if my wife's in the backseat and about to have a baby, he better get his red lights on and clear me a path mm -hmm. because it's an emergency. Now he can without breaking a felony. Otherwise, I'm just going to pass it. See, it's all in the words you use determines the jurisdiction you're in. Now, there may be that one guy. I missed class that day, so I have a file folder on the dash of my pickup. And it's 60 pages of case law that says I'm perfectly legal and doing everything I'm doing in every state. So I got Washington State's laws in there, and Utah's laws in there, and Arizona's laws in there, and Supreme Court case law in there. Would you like to read these and go through them, officer? Oh, no, I'm not reading that. He goes back to his car and he leaves. You know, later on at the donut shop, you can talk to a superior officer about that. But that's your opportunity to teach. Just be nice. 
you know, be nice. That's the key. If he feels the need, let him write you a ticket. If he writes you a ticket, take the ticket and with a red Sharpie pen at a 45 degree angle, say you're offered the contract is not accepted. As per Title 18, Section 242, you operate under the color of law. And as a state national, I'm not obligated to obey. And you mail it to the address listed on your ticket. Mm -hmm. It goes away. Once in a great while, they'll send you another follow-up letter. If you get the follow-up letter, you write on the letter with a 45 degree angle with a red fine tip Sharpie pen. I bought her the other day in Walmart because she needed a Sharpie pen. <laughs> and you write your operative contract, it's not accepted. For Title 18, Section 242, you operate under the color law, which I'm not obligated to obey. And you mail it in. See, I want you to understand right now, Courts are banks, judges are bankers. We are operating under banking law. All contract law is banking law. You have a 72 hour right of refusal. Every time you get a letter in your all caps name from a government or a government agency, you take a fine red Sharpie pen and you write across it, your offer the contract is not accepted. And you mail it back to them. You refuse the offer within 72 hours. That's your right of rescission period. Most people grab their documents and say, hang on to them for a month. What happens if you do, don't do 72 hours? Well, now you got to fight it a little harder and a little deeper. I'm trying to teach you guys how to handle it and be free. <laughs> With the red Sharpie, right? Buy a Bunch of red Sharpie, fine tip red Sharpies. Carry them in your car. <laughs> Carry them in your purse. Every time they write you a ticket, don't sign the ticket, don't contract. If you got to sign right without prejudice or write UCC 1-308 on it or write something on it that shows that you're not under duress. I don't care what it is. UCC 1-308 used to be 207, but the UCC code was rewritten, it's 308 now. Okay. So question real quick. So they send you the letter, you write on it. Should you write the date in a red Sharpie of when you did it? Because then Feel it takes free. time to- I'm well, hoping- I'm, I'm hoping trying to get it in within the 72 hours. I'll tell you what you do is you get an envelope with a, put your stamp on it and write the date on the, your envelope and then take a photocopy of it before you mail it off. I take a picture of it. Well, or a video quick board. You walk inside and you get stamped and certified. And that's good. Set some letters out. You want to get that. Then you take a photograph. It's U.S. Postal Service. They are obligated. And also on your documents when you file in the court. I'll tell you another little trick. I do. Because I would like to read these judges real well. I put a two cent stamp on every page <laughs> of my document and a one dollar stamp next to signature page. And I sign across it at a 45 degree angle from the lower left to the upper right, my name, and I write without prejudice across it there by canceling the stamp, creating a contract under the United Postal Nations laws and regulations, which that judge is under as a United States Postal District Court judge. So, so that and now his penalties <laughs> just got a whole lot steeper. So you so so put two cents <laughs> stamp on every page of the court document. Every page. And then a dollar stamp. Next to your signature. Next to, on the yeah, signature the page. And that puts them under the United States Postal Network, which is in Bern, Switzerland, and puts them under their laws, rules, and regulations, and the penalties are much stiffer if these judges ignore your documents. What is a postal it's stamp? stamp? It's a stamp, you know, like a letter. Two stamp, stamp, stamp that you stamp. mail something with? Mail a letter, you send a letter to your grandma. I know what a stamp is, but That's what, it. Is, what That's is the a dollar stamp that you also put on the page? They, they, you can One dollar is consideration, it's a contract. <laughs> yeah. Does the red felt pen work with the red license? No, if you went down and were dumb enough to get a driver's license because you're not in commerce, you just agreed to be in their jurisdiction. But you said you could you use the yeah car. if i'm driving my uber i'm going to use my driver's license if i'm hauling a load of hay off my ranch 
to Idaho to a dairy farm, I'm operating commerce. You have to use my CDL license. There's hey, nothing wrong with that. Hey, David, can, um, like in getting the passport, can you rescind having your driver's license and just use passport when you get your passport? If you don't ever plan on being in commerce, if you're not going to haul goods or services for resale on, over interstate lines, if you're not a public officer in the performance of their duties, yeah. or you're not hauling people for hire, then you don't need a driver's license. You need a passport. Well, here, here's how they sold us all into this. Okay. You're supposed to be 18 to get a passport. Don't get this at 14 years old look damn forward to get in their first car and a driver's license at 16. And not wait until 18. They did that on purpose. They did that on purpose. They did it to train all of you to look forward to getting your driver's license. 16. At age 16. Instead of waiting to travel with properly with your passport at age 18. <clears throat> so it was a scam job right from the beginning. So David, does the red, um, I do your offer of contract is not accepted. Does that work on CPS papers when they come into your home and they say you need to sign this? They're just a private for-profit business. It might as well be Burger King. So you walk into the shopping mall and there's probably a security guard. If I walked up to the security guard and said, man, I'm tired. I just don't want to make any decisions anymore. I'm going to give you my authority to rule over me. To tell me where to go, what to do, where to sit, where to eat, what to drive. I'm going to just going to, that's what he just did to the police officer. He's working for the city of what city we in? He's working for the city of Goodyear Police Department, which is a private for profit business. There's nothing de jure government about him. Do you understand that? He wasn't elected, he was hired by a corporation. He's not even government. He's no different, according to the Supreme Court, as any other corporation. So the security guard at the mall, if I give him my authority, then he can tell me the same thing a police officer can tell me if he wants to. He can tell me whatever he wants me to do. And by getting your driver's license, by saying you're a US citizen, by, by being a person, by being a resident, you have given your authority to the United States government and all its subsidiary corporations. The state of Arizona is a subsidiary corporation of the United States. The United States is actually a subsidiary corporation of the District of Columbia. And the sheriff's the same too, right? Sheriff is actually one of those guys that is caught in the middle <laughs> of serving two masters. And what does the Bible say about that? You can't serve God and money. Can't serve two masters. Can't serve God and money. Right. And he is being paid for by an incorporated county, even though he is an elected representative who is supposed to take an oath. That's why I quit the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. I can't swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and be paid for by a private corporation and told to shoot somebody. You can keep your driver's license in one pocket and your passport in the other. Okay. And then when you're traveling, which is going to the grocery store, mm -hmm. going to the movies, going to the doctor's office or the dentist appointment, you're traveling from your home. Okay. So I don't have to retain my driver's license. In order to no, you passport. don't have to. You can contract okay. with government. It's just understand something right now they wrote an unfair contract mm -hmm. in fact they wrote a contract where you sign in a box mm -hmm. so you can't if something goes wrong you can't sue the government for it because they'll just say it wasn't part of the contract they attorney this to death see here's part of the problem you know why our founding fathers created the title of nobilities act so no attorney can be hold public office because they knew attorneys would eventually take over the entire government. Okay, so if you look at our entire Congress, our entire Senate, 
our entire West Wing and our entire judicial department, the four branches of government. Last time I counted, there was only 25 non-attorney bar members in office. That means the Bar Association runs this nation. Congress doesn't run this nation. The Senate doesn't run this nation. The White House doesn't run this nation. The Bar Association runs this nation. The Bar Association is the enemy of the people. Okay. It's a private, for-profit, criminal, mafia organization. Mm -hmm. And so is the SPLC. <laughs> Last night I got home after seeing these guys. Home. Okay, it's not my home, but it's a home. And I'm watching the news. And on the news, this is a news anchor, and she's interviewing this attorney. And he's from a prominent law firm that has been socially attacked for their reputation. Oh. Oh. And one of the socially. wonderful things he says is how much they've helped the American public in winning their nine cases over the last seven years. All nine over the last seven years. I won 30 last month. Big prominent New York law firm won nine cases. Now they probably collected billions of dollars on those nine cases, right? Where I collected not much, nothing. Really. Good folks like you pay my gas, pay my airfare, give me a little bit of food to eat while I'm down here teaching, but I teach for free. And I'm in the hole. <laughs> I always have to put something out of my pocket in with it. Once in a great while, I come out a couple hundred dollars ahead and it helps me get to the next city, okay? But it's very rare. I've never charged anybody anything for this knowledge. I think everybody should learn it. See, my greatest fear is I raised 10 kids. Two adopted, eight were mine biologically. And they all grew up very independent and they hardly ever see their dad just because they're busy doing life and they moved to all different cities all over the place. But my greatest fear is now that I got 14 grandkids is that one of them are gonna knock on one of my daughter's houses and take their kids. That's my biggest fear. Mm -hmm. Not only that, my first six kids that I had at the time, I went through a divorce in 1988, sold my business, started another one, was a single dad raising my six kids who were between the ages of eight and six months. Wow. And I hired two babysitters. And the babysitters would show up at my house at 7 a.m. And I'd get home, I'd leave, and then I'd get home about six. And then they'd leave. But what I didn't know is they were covering for each other. They'd both show up. And then when I drove down the driveway, one of them would leave and go do their own thing, and I was paying both of them. And then the next day, the other one would leave, and they were taking turns, and this was a little inside agreement they had. And one of them was watching my six kids, and I had this door between my kitchen and my garage, and I kept a deadbolt in it and a little sign on it. The problem is that that's where my washer and dryer was in that particular house, was out in the garage. And the babysitter did a load of laundry. She left the door unlocked. My two-year-old son, Christopher, went in the garage, and there was gas for the lawnmower, and gas for the chainsaw, and gas for the weed trimmer, and all that stuff. And he spilled a little bit of gas on himself. She thought he might have drank some, because he got it on his hands, and he put his hands on his lips, and she smelled his lips, and they smelled like gas. So she ran him to the hospital. This is when I found out that there was only one person watching my kids she ran in the hospital well I get home from work on it's Friday and I get home from work and I see this note on the door I took your kids we're over at the hospital Christopher may have drank some gasoline out of the garage which was supposed to be in the first place and so I drive 100 miles an hour across town to the hospital I lived on the opposite side of town to the hospital and I get to the hospital and I run in and I'm standing at the desk and the nurse is there, and I'm asking her, you know, about my kids. I'm inquiring about my kids. And she keeps looking over my shoulder, right? Well, I was a Navy SEAL. <laughs> and I'm taught to scan 
you know? So I scan and I see two police officers and they're standing over there and I walk over to them and I say, hey, I need your help. My kids were brought in. I need to know where they are. She's not telling me anything. And as I'm talking to them, I'm looking out the window and I see my kids being loaded into a white van. No. So I started this way and one of them grabs me. I knock their asses to the ground and I go after the van. And I chase the van through the parking lot. Of course, I can't catch up with it. She's hauling me to get out of there. And CVS took my six kids. I think there's not a reason I'm doing this. So here's what happened. I went home, first of all, blew my, wanted to blow my brains out. Wondering what I was going to do. I was still going through the emotional distraught of just recently going through the divorce for no real reason. I mean, my, my wife and I mm. never fought, never argued. She told me later she must have had some kind of chemical imbalance after having Krisha. And she just wigged out one day. And she left while me and the kids were at church. We never even fought. We didn't have fight. We didn't argue. We didn't have money problems. I had a house and five rental houses at the time. So there's no real reason for her to leave other than she just wigged out one day, as she puts it. She moved a thousand miles away without the kids. What mother leaves her kids? Okay, that's another story. Anyway, here I am, a single dad, trying to raise these kids, trying to start another business, and my kids are gone. So the next morning, I get up, I go to the sheriff's office, and I say, Sheriff, I know you're a constitutional sheriff. I just got out of the military a couple of years ago. I need your help. Well, CPS, there's not much we can do, you know, the whole run around story that they give you all yet. Right? So I go to this CPS office, drive over to the CPS office, I'm looking through the door, they're closed, right? Saturday. They're closed. I'm looking through the door and I see somebody way back down that hallway. So I just start rapping on the door. And I'm there until my knuckles are bloody. And I'm rapping on the door. Finally, somebody comes up. No help whatsoever. So I go back to the sheriff's office. I said, Sheriff, I want you to see the CPS. There's no help whatsoever. I need something to happen right now. And if something doesn't happen right now, I'm going to do some investigative work and find out where my kids are being located. And he knew what I meant by that. Because if it came down to defending my family, protecting my family, I'd just slit their throat in their own kitchen. Okay? I might have went to jail for it later, but I wouldn't have done it. That's what I was trained to do. Sorry. Not being much help because he's torn between two masters and working for a county that receives money from CPS, from the courts. He hands me a business card. This business card had a man's name on it and a phone number. That's it. White card, little name, little phone number. Call the guy. I found out he was a retired prosecutor, federal level. For 23 years, he'd worked as a federal prosecutor. And I told him what happened. I said, I need your help. And you know what he did? He came over and he was concerned. And he was, a, he was an elderly guy. And we're still best friends today. And that was 1989 when this happened. <laughs> And he's really old now. But let me tell you something. He taught me a bunch of stuff. And he said, you know, the county is the county's courthouse. He says, I have to learn that everything I did for 23 years was against the law. That's what he told me. Yeah. Everything he did for 23 years was against the law. And let me tell you something. He's been arrested in every county in Oregon and thrown in jail for contempt. Because he goes to county courthouses and he stands up for the people. Mm -hmm. Even at his age, he doesn't care. Do you know attorneys turned his mother's home? Took his mother's home, turned it over to somebody else? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is he taught me all day Saturday. And he taught me all day Sunday. And Monday morning, I showed up at the county courthouse long before the open. I sat on the steps outside. I just waited. 
and I waited and I waited till the doors opened. And then I went in the county courthouse and I did what he said. I went and sat on a bench in the hallway and I stared through one of the little windows in the door to the courtrooms. And I waited till the court was in session and I could see the judge. And there's 50 people in that courtroom by now and I'm still sitting there waiting. I watched the judge walk in. I watched him walk over and sit down. And I stood up and I pushed the door open and I walked right up to the judge like this, like right here, like I own the place. Like I was his boss and he was my public servant. And I said, I'm a we the people, I'm a man. And I am here to ask for an emergency hearing in my court. In my court, not the circuit court of the county of Maricopa, but my court. I said, will you take the time today to hear me? Will you take your lunch out? And he said, yes, I will. You could see that I was serious. He said, you come back at noon. And I said, I need you to do me a favor. And he looked at me like, kid, I just did you a favor. I was 26. Kid, I just did you a favor. And I said, I need you to write out a little order, something I can go give the sheriff so that he'll go get the CPS officer. And he scribbled it out, signed his name to it. He says, take this down to the court clerk and she'll type it up proper. And I walked out of his courtroom and said, thank you, sir. I'll be back at noon. Well, he opened it. The court opened at 10. I waited until about 10, 15 to walk in there. I know the sheriff's department's clerk crossed down. The CPS office is just a little bit farther. And I had to get there pretty quick. So I ran downstairs. I just begged her to type this up for her. She stamped the judge's name on it. And I ran it across to the sheriff. The sheriff said he'd go do it. He ran over, got the CPS agent, and we ran back in the door at noon. And he, the judge is all done. He's dismissed everybody. He's sitting there waiting for me. And he said, can we go in our, my chambers? And me and the sheriff and the CPS officer walks in his chambers and he gets out a sandwich and his lunch. <laughs> I think he sent somebody for it, but then, you know, he got his drink out and he sits down in his chair. He says, I hope, he goes, I hope you don't mind if I eat while we talk. And I, of course I don't mind, you know, it's kind of a nice thing that he, he's hearing me. So, he says, tell me your story. So I just told my story, exactly what happened. And I told it, how quick it was, how I went to the sheriff's office, how we went beat on the door of the CPS, how I went back to the sheriff's office. You know, I told him the whole thing of what happened with my kids, how I was in, at work, how I got home, how I drove to the hospital. I told him every little detail very quickly. Quicker than I'm telling it to you now. It took me less time, I just rattled it off. I talked really fast back then. I wanted to slow my voice down so people can understand what I say. But I told him the story and he looks over the sheriff and he says, is that the story like you've heard it? And he goes, that's exactly what happened. He came right in my office, he did, you know, and the sheriff said, yes. And he looks at the CPS agent and he says, is that the story? And CPS couldn't deny any of it. That's exactly what happens, it's true, right? He wasn't happy that I had him there or that I could even get him there by a sheriff coming to get him, but I don't care if he's happy or not. That's not my problem, all right? Okay. And the judge looks back at me and he goes, well, what do you want to have happen here? I didn't expect him to say that at all. He goes, it's your court, right? Because I looked a little dumbfounded at it as a 26 year old kid when he said that to me. He goes, it's your court. What do you want to have happen here? And I said, well, I want my kids back and I want them back right now. And I'd like him fired. <laughs> Judge looks at me and goes, huh? and he goes, he looks over to the CPS agent and he says, uh, I want his kids back home by five o'clock and I want your resignation on my desk. I did just what I'm doing right now. I literally almost couldn't get up off his floor. I did my research and I found out that he'd worked for CBS for 22 years. Wow. Wow. Damn it. Okay. Uh, 
So if you wonder why I can get on an airplane and I fly down, it's because of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a potty break or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you.